Welcome, everybody. We will begin the meeting today, on May 17th, and we'll ask for roll. Grace? Jimenez? Perales? Cohen? Carrasco? Davis? Here. Esparza? Here. Arenas? Here. Foley? Here. Mahan? Here. Jones? Present. Licardo? Present. And that was a here from Cohen, just to note. Okay, we're all here, uh, or virtually. All right, uh, we'll move on then to the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, if you're able to stand, please join us. Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, today's invocation will be provided by Yosemar and Council Member Sparza will tell us more on behalf of Council Member Carrasco. Thank you. And uh I hope now is the time to send Council Member Carrasco your get well thoughts. Unfortunately, she's ill today oh. and uh, she sends her regrets. She really didn't want to miss this, but she was pretty sick. So, um, so as we continue to address some of the most pressing issues of the city and engage in meaningful dialogue, Council Member Carrasco wanted to take this moment to turn inwards for reflection keeping in mind the space that we occupy and the impact of our decisions. And so today's invocators are well known throughout the city and the region. Power couple Gerardo and Corina Herrera Loera. And as Chicanos, descendant of Pueblo, Pame, and Huidadica nations, Gerardo and Corina are active members of the local urban indigenous community who work to reclaim, preserve, and perpetuate the traditional healing practices of indigenous cultures on behalf of past, present, and future generations. Professionally, Gerardo is the Director of Development and Communications for the Indian Health Center of Santa Clara Valley. And Corina is a 16-year veteran probation officer who teaches in the Chicano Studies Department at San Jose State University. And some might also know her as a trustee for the Alum Rock Union Elementary School District. Both individually and as a duo, they are a powerful spiritual force in our community for young and younger, serving as critical role models at a time when so many of our residents are searching for meaning in their lives. Corina and Gerardo stand as pillars in our community and have, have been and are a guiding light. We are fortunate that much of the work that they have dedicated their lives to has been centered in the East Side and especially during these past years of our crisis. Corina and Gerardo have served with dignity and grace. And by the way, we'd like to congratulate them on their union as they recently celebrated their anniversary. And Council Member Carrasco and all of us give you our love. Thank you for listening. And I kindly ask as both Corina and Gerardo are here and leading us today in our invocation. Uh, thank you for that uh, introduction, Council Member um, Arenas. I'm sorry, Esparza, excuse me. <laughs> Um, I'm really glad to be here today. Um, thank you for, for those beautiful words um, and really uh, grateful to uh, Council Member Carrasco's office for uh, inviting us here today. Uh, Mayor and Council Members, thank you for having us in this space. This is our, our second time coming here on behalf of um, Council Member Carrasco's office and, and really grateful to be here as a representative uh, family um, of, of our urban indigenous community. Um, the institutions that we work for, furthering the work that we stand for in this life, um, really grateful to be here beside my wife. Um, and at this time, she's going to lead us through this ritual, um, a ritual, a ceremony that we utilize in our Mexica dance community. Uh, it's a ritual of inclusion. It's a reminder that we are all the sum of all of our relations, all things that exist in this world, uh, from the living and breathing to those things that are uh, inanimate objects. We are all related. Um, so at this time, 
I know you all are seated and council members are seated. And so we're going to do this gesture while we might normally do this in community, asking our relatives to stand and follow us through these motions. Uh, we're going to do this on behalf of each and every one of you and all of those that we represent. At this time, uh, my wife's going to take care of this, this spiritual um, aspect of this here ritual for us, um, turning to the eastern direction, reminding us of the masculine essence that each and one of us is made up of from the top of our head to the bottom of our feet, that, that we be in balance and in health with that masculine essence. She's going to turn at this time to the West, reminding us to think about the feminine essence within each of, within each of us, that essence of creativity and fierceness that watches over us since the beginning of our life um, and beyond. At this time, uh, Corina is going to turn to the Northern direction, reminding us of all of the elders in our community, and especially the ancestors' shoulders upon which we stand as we further the work on their behalf, and more importantly, on behalf of future generations. Purina is turning now to a southern direction, a reminder for us of the children that we do this work for, not only the child spirit that's within each and one of us, that that child spirit be nourished, but that the work we do be impactful for generations to come. This time she's turning back towards the center in our, in our ways here. There are seven directions. She's facing her attention um, upwards above us, thinking about the environment that surrounds us and how it is that we're connected to that environment, the air that we breathe, that breath of life. She's going to turn again, reminding us to think about the earth that we inhabit, how she provides for us endlessly, generously, uh, and reciprocity for the ways in which we care for her, um, always thinking about our impact on our, on our Mother Earth. She's going to turn again, and in our ways, there's this reminder in this seventh direction as we acknowledge all of those things, all of our, the, our constituents that we represent in those directions, the essence of those directions, but also built into this ritual here is a reminder that we also get to take care of ourselves. And so thinking about that wellness, healing, impactful, intentional life that we want to live, uh, making a difference in this world each and every day. So um, at this time, you know, thinking about all of us here, the health of our community, the health of us individually and collectively, thinking about the health of our members that might not be able to be here with us at this time, like, uh, like Council Member Carrasco. Um, I'm going to take a moment and think a little bit about why it is that we're here, why it is that we fill these seats. What, what brings us to this space today? What is it that we stand for? What is it that we hope to see? And ask you all to just resonate with that thought and that intention in your mind while we offer a ceremonial song. And it's important for us to do this piece. It means that much to us and our family in particular and for our urban indigenous community. It wasn't until 1978 that the American Indian uh, Freedom of Religion Act was passed, um, ensuring our ability to access ceremonial sites and giving us the right to practice our ceremonial ways in a public way. Before 1978, we were persecuted. We were put into jails and, and oftentimes even put to death uh, because of the, uh, our practice of these ways. And so for us, it's important to demonstrate these things in public spaces. So you all think along with us what it means to have policies like those things in place and why it is that we're here today and what it is that we, that we stand for moving forward. And, and of course, we never want to forget our relatives uh, ancestral homelands of the Muwekma Ohlone tribe of the San Francisco Bay Area, um, as they continue their efforts uh, towards reestablishing themselves as a federally recognized tribe, guaranteeing them and their own rights to be able to practice their ways in the same way that we're doing this here today. Hey, nay, don't we are not, 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 hey,
Thank you all for your kind attention. Thank you both. Thank you very much. All right, uh, we ha now have several ceremonial items. Uh, I'm gonna need to step out uh, for a call with uh, members of the legislature, legislative leadership. So I'm gonna ask Vice Mayor Jones to, uh, to call the item, next item, which I believe uh, Councilmember Spars will be presenting on behalf of Councilmember Carrasco uh, to recognize and proclaim Melanoma Awareness Month. Hello, everyone. Hey. <laughs> I just want to say uh, that this is a topic very near and dear to Council Member Carrasco's heart. Um, I know that uh, if she could, she would be here today. Um, and so melanoma awareness, uh, this month, every May, we recognize this month as National Skin Cancer and Melanoma Awareness Month to share our stories and promote prevention of the most prevalent and dangerous type of skin cancer. Nearly 100,000 Americans are expected to be diagnosed with an invasive or dangerous melanoma, melanoma. And just this year alone, tragically, about 8,000 of them will pass away. So some of you may remember uh, the story of Councilmember Carrasco's mother Maria Carrasco, a lifelong uh, Del Monte cannery worker. She departed this earth in 2018, surrounded by family, after a long 13-year battle with skin cancer. And according to Councilmember Carrasco, that time was marked by painful radiation and eventually a nose amputation. So if Councilmember Carrasco ever comes at you with a bottle of sunscreen, as I know she has with me and all of us, uh, just know it's out of love. And for those who may be unaware, melanoma is a type of skin cancer that results in new or changing moles on the skin and is the deadliest type of skin cancer. It's developed by constant and or harsh sun and UV exposure, often affecting lighter skin people at higher rates than those with darker skin. But, but it's important to remember that it is a myth that darker skin people are immune or less susceptible to cancer. It is not true. Additionally, research has shown that severe sunburns when you're young increases your chance or chances of skin cancer exponentially. So it's important to make sure that our little ones are protected as their skin is incredibly delicate. And chances of diagnosis increase with age, statistically higher in those over 50 and are more prevalent among men rather than women. And so this is important to remember. So keep in mind, men tend to develop skin cancer on the top of their ears, whereas women are diagnosed more often on their noses. And there's literature that points to commonly worn articles of clothing like hats or beanies that mark these differences in men versus women uh, with longer hair and bigger hats. Uh, so what do we know? That regardless of your gender, regardless of the pigment of your skin or the lifestyle you live, incorporating sunscreen, and Council Member Carrasco wants you to know, SPF 30 and above, into your skincare routine is important to keep you safe from harmful UV rays. The key is to repeat, 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 putting your sunscreen on or else it's no good. And don't forget when you're driving, your hands are also exposed and sunscreen also helps uh, with aging and sun damage. And so Councilmember Carrasco kindly urges you all to wear sunscreen, wear layers, and check your moles and freckles, making note of the following five factors. 
asymmetry, growth, color, size, and irregularity. And likewise, she wanted to make sure to thank all the council colleagues, city staff, and CBOs that have stood together in championing an urban canopy that will aid in ensuring that our most vulnerable San Jose communities are protected through the shade that trees provide. Because as ruthless as this disease can be, it is preventable, both at the institutional and personal level. So this commitment to health and safety falls on all of us. So thank you for taking the time to listen, and it's with a lot of respect that we can present this proclamation to Olga Tabor with the California Skin Institute. The California Skin Institute is the largest California-based dermatology medical group with the most nationally recognized award-winning dermatologists, surgical dermatologists, plastic surgeons, and derma dermatopathologists under one umbrella with the goal of providing unparalleled patient care in medical and aesthetic dermatology. With 43 locations across California, they are a center of excellence when it comes to the diagnosis and treatment of skin cancer and other skin-related diseases, providing Medicare-approved outpatient surgery centers in San Jose, Los Gatos, and Mountain View. In addition to providing the best-in-class care to their skin cancer patients, they often partner with the Skin Cancer Foundation and other organizations to spread awareness of skin cancer through social media campaigns and through their doctors who selflessly volunteer their time doing free skin cancer screenings in the community. So thank you for your incredible work. And Olga, if you could please come and say a few words. Thank you so much, Councilmember Esparza, and I'm thankful to Councilmember Carrasco who got in touch with us last week. Um, thank you to the City Council and the Mayor. Um, I'm honored to accept this award today on behalf of all California Skin Institute doctors, advanced practitioners, and all clinical and administrative staff that take care of our skin cancer patients day in and day out. Um, California Skin Institute, just very quickly about us, California Skin Institute was established in 2007 by Dr. Greg Morgenroth. Um, who's a fellowship trained physician who unfortunately couldn't be here today because he's in surgery all day. Um, so since 2007, California Skin Institute has grown into over 40 locations with thousands of patients across California. We focus on expert skin cancer diagnosis and treatment in every office, including a nationally recognized center for training in most surgery, advanced reconstructive surgery, and local anesthesia cosmetic surgery. Uh, we have a state-of-the-art state full-service dermatopathology department led by our internationally known board-certified dermatopathologist offering advanced diagnostic techniques. Although we provide a wide range of medical dermatology and aesthetic services, our core focus remains to be um, medical dermatology, specifically we focus on skin cancer, diagnosis, and treatment. Um, unfortunately, skin cancer is the most common cancer of all cancer types. I'm not sure if a lot of people know that. Um, you've summarized it very nicely. Melanoma is being the deadliest cancer out of all. Um, so it, three million cases diagnosed in the United States according to American Cancer Society. In fact, thousands of people every year in California. Uh, the good news is that skin cancer is highly treatable um, when caught early. And we do run awareness campaigns by partnering with skin cancer organizations and other companies to raise awareness of this disease. We've just had a webinar, um, in fact, today at noon on skin cancer prevention, and it is available um, on, on California Skin Institute YouTube channel. Our doctors volunteer in California communities to provide free skin cancer screenings. Just one such initiative is taking place uh, this Saturday at Mills Peninsula Hospital's Dorothy Schneider Cancer Center. I want to share some statistics with you. Um, last year, in 2021, CSI, California Skin Institute, found 38,000 cancers and 13,000 people. Of those over 8,000 cancers, 2,400 people were in Santa Clara County, a county obviously that contains San Jose. Since 2012, our doctors identified over 111,000 cancers in Santa Clara with 13,000 treated. Uh, just this year alone, in 2022, we have identified over 3,000 cases already and have treated 1,100 um, 1, patients. Throughout the pandemic, California Skin Institute of locations remained open and played a critical role in providing our patients throughout California 
with exportation services as they manage the impact of COVID-19. To summarize again, thank you so much for this proclamation. Obviously, it's very important to us. That's, that's kind of what we do. So I appreciate it. I appreciate the Vice Mayor. Uh, and remember to get your um, skin, skin checks often, especially if you're genetically or environmentally predisposed. Thank you again. Council Member Arenas, please uh, come over and we're going to proclaim um, Queer and Transgender Asian Pacific Islander Awareness Week. Good afternoon. As a council member for District 8, I'm honored to be here today to recognize this is the first Queer, Transgender, Asian Pacific Islander QTAPI, which is what I'm going to refer to um, throughout my, um, my talking points. This is the first time we're going, to, um, we're going to recognize QTAPI Week in the city of San Jose. And with me is Vaughn from Aki. Um, and uh, I'll talk about him in just a little bit. But first I wanted to talk about uh, the Queer, Queer Transgender Asian Pacific Islander Week, um, which is a time to celebrate the contributions and accomplishments of the QTAPI community. And the first QTAPI Week was recognized and celebrated in May 22nd of 2021 and spearheaded by the Bay Area Q. TAPI Coalition. Um, it expanded in February of this year and includes uh, organizations that are serving AAPI, Asian um, American Pacific Islanders, and LGD, LGBTQ plus residents of Silicon Valley, including GLBTQ plus Asian Pacific Alliance, Asian Pacific, Asian Americans for Community Involvement, Paravar, Bay Area, Silicon Valley Pride, and South Bay Queer and Asians. As an ally for the queer, transgender, Asian Pacific Islander community, it is really important for me to raise awareness and visibility, especially for our youth and adults who may be at a critical time in their identity development journey. I feel that QTAPI Awareness Week really inspires all of us to be our most authentic selves. Joining me today is Vance Villaverde, and he is um, here to speak uh, on behalf of Aki, and he's also the Director of Advocacy at the Asian American for Community Involvement Agency, which was uh, founded really to meet the needs of AAPI community members seeking cultural and linguistic care. And it soon evolved to offer health, behavioral health and wellness services, including HIV outreach, prevention and education, and getting the lowdown on wellness. This is not my words. This is actually the name of the program, which I thought was really um, sassy. It does, it's the acronym is GLOW, uh, that specifically targets LGBTQ plus clients. I would like to recognize the GLBTQ plus Asian Pacific Alliance, Asian American for Community Involvement, Paravar Bay Area, Silicon Pride, South Bay Queer and Asians, Thank you for your commitment and dedication to the QTAPI community. I invite everyone to learn more about the QTAPI Queer Transgender Asian Pacific Islander Awareness Week by participating in activities that will be held throughout the week of May 29th all the way to June 4th. So next, I would like to invite 
Vaughn Villaverde to share a few words. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, uh, and thank you so much, Council Member Arenas, Mayor Licardo, and the rest of the members of the City Council for inviting us to join you today to accept this proclamation commemorating Queer Trans API Week. Uh, as, uh, as the Council Member mentioned, my name is Vaughn Villaverde, Director of Advocacy at ACI, and we are part of a coalition of organizations and community members planning events uh, and commemorations across the Bay Area in Los Angeles and in San Diego. Queer Trans API Week began in 2020 in San Francisco and is held during the week that straddles API Heritage Month in May and Pride Month in June. This movement began as a way of building community and celebrating unique histories uh, and cultural heritage of queer and trans API communities. However, with the incidents of anti-Asian hate we saw across the country in recent weeks, we, the coalition saw Queer Trans API Week as an opportunity to promote our community's visibility and resilience in the face of all these challenges. Um, as the council member also mentioned, ACI is but one of a number of organizations planning events around this week, uh, which includes Silicon Valley Pride, GAPA, the GLBTQ plus Asian Pacific Alliance, part of our Bay Area, and the Vietnamese American Roundtable. And we would be remiss if we didn't recognize the amazing work that they do. We're so grateful to the City Council and to the City of San Jose for their willingness to work with us uh, on this proclamation and in recognizing Queer Trans API Week for the first time in San Jose. Thank you. All right, we have several members of our fierce public works team here, and I want to ask if they would be kind enough to join us here with our fearless leader, Matt Kano, because we are celebrating Public Works Week, not just in the city of San Jose, but I think nationally, the American Public Works Association, celebrating the 62nd. Oh, we got a bigger group than I thought, wow, okay. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Joe, John. All right. And uh, nice to see John Risto here to reflect the fact that Public Works, we know, uh, connects us across many departments, across many functions here in our city. Uh, so this is the 62nd annual National Public Works Week. And uh, we've also got, uh, we've got many members, of course, of our team, but it is a much larger team uh, because they do so much in our city, and I'm reminded about just how important public works is by the story of how we they first discovered how to stop a pandemic in England uh, back in the, I believe it was the 18th century, someone figured out uh, that a pandemic was spreading all because of a single polluted water well. And uh, it was in fact an act of public works that saved thousands of lives. And we know how important public works is to our public health as well as to our safety. Uh, the community building work uh, that this and other members of the team engage in include our roads, our bridges, sanitary and stores, storm systems, street lights, traffic signals, as well as community facilities like parks, fire stations, libraries, community centers, service yards, and yes, city hall. Uh, they also drive the maintenance of these many important investments as well as uh, our technology such as radio communication system, the fleet vehicles and facilities. Uh, and a lot of economic development impacts through development services in the Office of Quality Assurance, ensuring that everyone is getting paid rightfully what is theirs. Uh, and last but not least, of course, uh, our furry friends are also uh, protected through the great work of the Public Works team. Uh, and that I think we all know that animal services is, is so very important. And we've heard from a lot of animal services advocates in recent weeks, I should tell you, at our budget hearings. So believe me, we get it. So uh, just a few highlights from last year alone, what Public Works has accomplished. During the pandemic, staff continue to repair and enhance electrical services at the Police Administration Building in Happy Hollow Park and Zoo, managed installation and security system at branch library sites, delivering power services at multiple 
Office of Cultural Affairs events, uh, the dozens of events we've had as part of uh, our efforts to engage the community more outdoors. Uh, Public Works completed 31 CIP, that's our big construction investment program, uh, except that's not what CIP stand for, is it? No. Anyway, I'll get back to you on that. Uh, valued over $59 million with 91% delivered on time. It's fantastic. Responding to 79,000 underground service alert marketing requests to protect utilities in 2021. We know what happens uh, when we don't do that. There's always a, a, a big mess. And so that is critically important. Uh, and, and animal care services completed more than 21,000 calls for services, 59,000 animal licenses, uh, 4,000 low cost spay and neuter surgeries. A lot of stuff is happening uh, in this department. And we're grateful for all the work they do, even though perhaps not always noticed uh, directly by our residents. We know what happens if it's not done well, then it's clearly noticed by our residents because the impacts are severe. And so this is the team that gets it done uh, without a lot of recognition. And we're grateful for their great work. And with that, I'd like to give this mic to our director, Matt Kino. Thank you, Mayor Ricardo. I re really appreciate the kind words. Thank you. And before I start, I just want to quickly thank um, John Risto, Kerry Romano um, from ESD. There are two other directors in the um, city, of San Jose, city of San Jose who actually serve as public works directors as well on certain projects. And then additionally, all the other partners in the city of San Jose, all the other departments from finance to HR to the city manager's office um, and all of our partners' departments, we can't do it, we can't do it without you. I'm just, I've been in awe the past four years since I've been the public works director. The, the, amount, and the, the amount of hard work dedication and the variety of the work that we do in our department is um, just, I learn a million new things every day. Um, my goal every day is to continue to support the team because they do amazing work and they're really dedicated to public service. And the change, the change that they create in the community is, is beyond measure and, and um, overwhelms me at times because I'm so appreciative of the work they do. So I just wanna thank you all and everybody you're representing today for all the work that you do. And I really appreciate um, the Mayor and City Council for this recognition on National Public Works Week. Thank you. All right, on orders of the days, anyone in the council have changes the printed agenda? Councilmember Arenas? Yes, Mayor. I would like to defer item 3.5, which is actions related to the Measure T status report on a work plan okay. and implementation updates. I don't believe that there is a timeline or um, delaying this would create any issue. Okay, did you have a desired date that you wanted to move this to? You know, I can leave it up to staff to. Okay, and and just to check in with Matt, uh, to confirm this, on all of our RFPs, you have all the direction you need um, for all the projects that are coming up. I know we've got a couple of fire station bids this year. We don't need any direction from the council at this point. Thank you, Matt Kane, Director of Public Works. Um, it, it, I think it would depend on how long the deferral is. I don't know. I apologize. I didn't hear. Okay. S two, two, two items we have. One is there is a recommendation in the report to appropriate two hundred fifty thousand dollars to um, upgrade, do some immediate upgrades to the existing police gun range. A one week deferral isn't going to one or a couple weeks deferral isn't going to impact that significantly. But that's something we'd want to move forward with quickly. 
Um, and then also our Citizens Oversight Committee report is also tied to this today. And our Citizens Oversight Committee chair is here today. Um, and again, I'm not saying it, it's council's decision on deferring. Yeah. I just wanna make you aware of that. It is a report as of the end of last fiscal year. So, but there's no, to answer your question direct, more directly, I guess I have all the direction I need. I'm not gonna stop working on anything right, right now. Okay, so. and I know particularly station 32 uh, in Councilmember Sparse's district, as I understand, there's there's gonna be an ad alternate in that bid that will enable us to compare the cost of a dual bay versus single bay, is that right? Correct, we're already designing that ad alternate, um, and even if it doesn't get funded, we're still designing it right now, so a delay on this item would not change that. Okay, all right. Councilmember Sparza, was you, that? You answered my okay. question. Okay. <laughs> okay, great. And Councilmember Frost? That's for the, the current gun range, right? That's, that's, yes, that's, that's Yes, the current gun range needs some um, quick upgrades, and so um, I, we wouldn't we wouldn't want, if there was a significant delay on this current Measure T report, we would want to seek a different um, way to get that money authorized. Okay, I would I would echo that. The uh, police department has just uh, initiated the next round of qualifications, the required quali qualifications for every six months, and I happened to go on day one, and two of the machines broke down on day one. Um, and so I know they're trying to get the whole department uh, qualified, so I, I would echo that that probably needs to be done pretty quick. Thank you. And didn't have to do with your shooting. <laughs> no, I passed. Okay. <laughs> so, 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 Matt, it sounds like we just, if we brought it back uh, before the end of the fiscal year, that should work for you, for you from the, an appropriation perspective? Correct. On, on the, yes, yes. On the okay, gun range, so we're ready to move now, but we can, you know, it's been. If that's okay. If, if, if I could just maybe ask council to consider, uh, I, I'm fine pushing these items off because I really like to know what those bids are going to be on those fire stations to really understand, you know, what, what we've got left. Uh, if if this item around the two hundred fifty thousand dollar expenditure uh, needs to be prioritized, if staff would consider just taking it separately to council and we can approve it, and then uh, enable us to be able to defer this to at least have enough time to take in more information about how much money we've got, I think that might be helpful for the council. That that sounds like a plan. Okay. Mayor, so you're proposing pulling out the 250K now and voting on it now? Uh, either now or whenever Matt decides you need it. If, if we can bifurcate it, yeah. then we can do it now. It's been okay. agendized. Okay. So uh, I think Councilman Arenas had the floor but didn't make a motion. Would you like to make a motion? Uh, sure, I'll make a motion um, to defer this item um, with what the staff has already identified in terms of the timeline and um, and bifurcate uh, this this uh, vote by um, pulling out I, I don't, I, uh, item D one. Thank you, because yeah. my my uh, my items are not coming up. Um, oh, D1 and then bifurcating D one. Thank okay. you. And D two. Yes, and I'll D2. second that. And I'll second that. Yeah, thank you. I should have said D two as well. Okay, uh, so that's the motion. Any questions about what we're doing? Comments? Okay, I'll Let's second. Let's vote on that motion. Do we take public speakers before or after the orders of the day? Uh, I think on orders of the day, we don't take public, wait a minute. Yeah, if there's a change, you're right, we do. All right, thank you. Yeah, let's go ahead and take a public speaker. Uh, Blair Beekman. Hi, Blair Beekman here. Um, Thank you that you caught yourself, Mayor, and realized that there is need for public comment at times like this. I think uh, these sort of items need to be have a bit more consistency. So it's obvious to ourselves and clear that there should be public comment at times like this. Thank you for allowing public comment. To simply offer um, for this sort of item, I hope that we can talk about it a bit more if needed with the uh, Measure T item coming up today. And, uh, you know, the, these are issues of uh, community public health and, and community safety that we tried to talk about at budget meetings yesterday. And I just hope we can all work to want to make an open and clear process for ourselves uh, what, what, what is possible and at stake with this sort of item to be able to bring it back soon and not rush it through is important. And uh, I hope we can talk about it today at uh, Measure T items if needed. And, and we can feel okay in doing that. Thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, good. Back to the council. Yep. All right. Let's vote on the motion. 
Perales? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mayhan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Thank you. Okay, that passes. Aaron, I have a question. Yes. Is anybody, uh, any council member on Zoom? Why there's, can, there's no council members so on Zoom. So why can't oh, we case, just we vote need... on the screen? Oh, okay, we'll just vote on the screen from now on. I just always assume there's somebody on Zoom, but there's not. <laughs> uh, can I make sure I know how to uh, set up the vote on the screen? I've never had to do it. Okay. Just for, for the folks watching at home, Tony's sick today, so we're, uh, we're all doing our best. I'm here on Zoom, so if you, you click the item and then you click vote on the item. <laughs> Tony's sick, but she's still working. <laughs> Thank you for your dedication, Tony. I just wish I was there. <laughs> yeah, I should confirm. Councilmember Jimenez is not on Zoom. Okay. All right. So we are all present then, those of us who are participating. Okay. Let's then go to the closed session report. Nora? Thank you, Mayor. We do not have a report out of closed session today. Okay. On the consent calendar, let's pull items that the council would like to pull. I've gotten notices that Councilman Cohen would like to pull item 2.7, which is the settlement of San Clara Unified School District versus City of San Jose. And Councilman Mayhem would like to pull 2.12, which are actions related to the purchase order for citywide graphic design services. Uh, I'd like to ask if there are other items that my colleagues would like to pull from the consent calendar. I'm not seeing any notification. So let's start with item 2.7 settlement with Santa Clara Unified. And I want to thank uh, Councilmember Cohen and Stacy on his team for their hard work in getting us to an agreement and thank uh, the good folks at the uh, Santa Clara Unified for their work in educating our children. Well, that's what I kind of was going to do, but um, oh, okay. no, I, I, no, I mainly just want to thank Santa Clara Unified for uh, making the agreement with us and and just uh, kind of ex make a point that this is good good news for North San Jose. We're going to have one and a half million dollars now to get started on the work at Agnews Park, which was otherwise delayed and looking forward to doing the master planning on the park and wanted to just uh, thank the council for helping us get to this settlement so that we can uh, do some important work for the residents in District 4 in North San Jose. Uh, this is this was a, an, a, an example of how we can <clears throat> come up with collaborative and creative ways to to settle when we have disagreements with other jurisdictions. Um, this has been kind of stuck for a while, and I think this is a good deal for everybody. Um, so, just want to uh, thank Nora and and Johnny, your team, for helping us get to this settlement and uh, move its approval. Well, although there's another item to pull, so we'll. I guess we'll we'll, take a we'll wait till we get to the yeah. next item. Yeah, and we're also going to pull 2.17 separately to vote separately on that item. Uh, I'll explain why in a moment. Um, okay, uh, and I, I should also note that you know Councilmember Cohen mentioned creativity and and positive solution. That this is going to help us get a park built, which is really important to the school and to the community. So that's a great thing. Um, let's let's hear any public comment on item 2.7. There's no hand. Okay, we'll move on to item 2.12, which are actions related to purchase order for citywide graphic design services. Councilmember Mayhan. Thank you, Mayor. And I just have a quick uh, comment and question for staff. Um, I, you know, first I'll just say I'm really glad to see that we are investing in design capacity for the city. Obviously, public communication is so core to what we do as a city government, and our residents are increasingly using communication media that are heavily visual, social media in particular. So I, I'm really glad that we're making this investment. The question I have is, you know, in my experience, managing outsourced design resources is incredibly labor intensive. And I see here that we're looking at a number of different potential contractors and a potential annual cost of $1.2 million. And I'm, I'm curious how much we have I think this question's prob probably for um, Carolina. Um, have, have we evaluated or compared in-house versus contracted out the uh, sort of management of those resources and whether or not we might actually be better off in the long run having a smaller in-house team dedicated to design services for the whole city? 
Carolina Camarena, Director of Communications. Council Member Mahan, I think that's an excellent question. I want to start by noting that um, currently we use our graphic design services intermittently. So it's not a 24 hour operation in all of the departments and you all have the ability to use any of the graphic designers that we have as vendors. I think it's a great question and it's something that we can look at and we can provide a cost analysis, maybe in an info memo. Sure. Okay. That would be great. I, I just feel I, my sense is based on what I, what I've heard from you in the past and seen here, our needs in this area are only growing. And at some point managing a bunch of different external consultants may actually be costing it. We may get less for more than if we, if you actually were able to hire those resources in house. So I'd love to see an analysis of that at some point. Great. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much. Okay, Mayor, that's all, that's all I had and all, um, do I need to move that item? Here's what I'd like to suggest is if you make a motion, you approve all the items except for 2.8A and 2.17. We're going to consider those separately. Great. So, so move. So I'll move all items except 2.8A and 2.17. Okay. Second. Let's hear public comment. I'm sorry, the second from Councilmember Cohen? Okay. Uh, and let's hear public comment on those consent items. Blair Beekman. Hi, Blair Beekman here to speak on uh, consent calendar. I think uh, the majority of consent calendar items at this time. I wanted to speak on items 2.13 through 2.16. Um, basically, uh, 2.13 to 2.15 uh, to me are items that speak to uh, budgeting issues. And the ideas of, uh, you know, what we talked about yesterday that I felt was really interesting that. <laughs> For some reason, my my uh, Zoom got really cut off, and I'm really sorry about that. Last uh, uh, at noontime yesterday, I was trying to say that um, uh, yesterday's budget meeting on these sorts of items 2.13, 2.14, and 2.15, um, Councilperson Arenas and Esparza spoke really nicely about uh, ideas of we have to talk about the concepts of uh, racial equity in the, in the future of our budgeting questions. And Councilperson Esparza nicely mentioned, uh, you know, if we have a core set of services that we all negotiate around and understand what can be good racial equity ideas as a whole community process, that's, that's an important goal that I think can consistently through our years really be of help to ourselves. And it is through things like these playground projects and understanding the racial equity ideas involved. And it's coming to a common agreement about that I really wish yourselves good luck on. And, uh, and just thank you for those sort of words that were said yesterday that made things very clear for myself how to view this, uh, the future of equity and, and what we can be working towards uh, and how to view ourselves for our future. Thank you. Brian Darby. Thank you. I agree with what Mr. Um, McMahon said about the equity, and I think it, I'm glad that that was brought up. And I just wanted to reiterate that. Thank you very much. Back to council. Thank you. All right. Let's vote. I have my light on. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, forgive yeah. me. Me too. Um, no, I mean, he pulled it, so I just. I'm going to comment on North San Jose and I just wanted to say thank you, Mayor. I know you've been super engaged. It's an understatement on this. And I wanted to also thank Councilmember Cohen um, for his leadership on North San Jose, which is so strategic to our city. Um, so I just wanted I, I just wanted to acknowledge acknowledge that. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Councilmember Perales. Yeah, thank you. I had a question actually, um, and you could give a head nod. Uh, Carolina, on the graphic design services, you said that the council offices can tap into that. Do we have to cover that or that's covered in the, the money that we've already, okay, great. So we can we can tap into that resource and that's covered under that that purchase order. Okay, and I'll just say, I I, uh, I think uh, former council member, uh, Pierre Luigi Oliverio uh, is always remaining a good steward of uh, our financial uh, orders and, and RFPs here. I think he reached out to council member Mahoney, he reached out to me as well. And so I, I just give him a nod for, continually keeping an eye on, <laughs> on some, of, some of these things as he always did when he was here. Thanks. All right, thank you. Okay, uh, we'll vote now on the portion of the consent calendar that Councilmember Mahan has moved. You can do that on our screens. Nice work, Henry. 
Thank Great you. job, Henry. Okay. He's rolling now. All right. Uh, <laughs> all right. So we now have 2.8A and 2.17. I know for the right, Councilmember Reynos is leaving uh, for a moment. I'll move approval. Okay. Second. Let's, I'm oh, sorry, is there any public comment on those items? There's no hands up. Okay, thank you, Grace. Let's vote. All right, and uh, that passes unanimously with when it's extension. All right, we'll move forward now to. Mayor, that was 2.8 and 2.17, right? Yeah. Yeah, that was together. That was my understanding of the motion. Is that anybody confused Just about that? Just want to confirm that. Okay. Thanks. All right, let's move forward then to item 10.2. Okay, we're going to take these separately. Is that right, Nora? Yes. Okay, so we're going to have public comment on 10.2A and then a vote followed by public comment on the remainder of 10.2 in the second vote. So that's by the request of the city of Santa Clara. We're happy to do that. This is 10.2, uh, of course, the North San Jose Strategy Settlement Agreement with City Santa Clara and Amendment to the General Plan North San Jose Area Development Policy. Uh, amendment to Title 20 and other provisions. We do have a presentation of four. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Chris Burton, Director of Planning, Building, and Code Enforcement. Um, can you just give us one moment just to get our presentation up? Uh, while we do, I'll just mention that I'm joined in the box today uh, by a host of staff. Um, I'm joined by Michael Brio and David Keon from the Department of Planning, Building, and Code Enforcement, Nancy Klein from the Office of Economic Development and Cultural Affairs, uh, Rosalind Huey, our Deputy City Manager from the City Manager's Office, Johnny Fan from the City Attorney's Office, and then John Risto uh, and Ramses Madhu from the Department of Transportation. We're also supported by a number of staff and other departments um, who've been along for the ride. So, um, North San Jose, we're going to um, present uh, all of our information in, in one presentation, and then we'll be uh, available to split out the conversation into, as you noted previously. Um, just to start us off, uh, we talk about North San Jose not necessarily in the strictest geographical sense. Uh, what we're actually talking about is the area development policy area, which closely aligns with the former redevelopment area throughout North San Jose. It's generally that area between uh, the Highway 237, 101, and 880, um, with a couple of little uh, bump outs uh, on either side. Oh, moment. Okay, so our goal in North San Jose, it's, it's an important part of a number of different goals in both the previous general plan and uh, our current general plan. North San Jose remains uh, a, an economic driver, not just for the city, but for the entire region. And as a result, we've had a comprehensive planning effort throughout this area um, since 2005. Uh, the intent is to obviously uh, address uh, some of the goals in the general plan of providing housing, both uh, market rate and affordable housing throughout the area, as well as new employment opportunities, uh, so space for both industrial and uh, office jobs. Um, to allow uh, residents that work in the area to sort of live closer, the intent is to bring those uses together and create a much more mixed use environment. Um, with that, um, we're intending to create great places with uh, rich amenities that offer the services uh, and the amenities that those residents and workers need throughout the area. So to give just some brief background, and I know we've talked about this a number of times, but so I will be brief with this. Um, the city adopted a policy for North San Jose um, that, that sat over the top of a, an old existing land use policy back in 2005, uh, which is the San Jose, North San Jose Area Development Policy, or the ADP. Um, the intent was following the dot-com crash was to plan for future growth in the area um, and plan for the transportation improvements that were needed to mitigate and offset uh, impacts related to that growth. The plan included uh, about 26.7 million square feet of office R&D development, um, 32,000 residential units, about 2.7 million square feet of, of retail development, both uh, neighborhood serving and large format, and 1,000 hotel rooms. Um, and to offset that uh, impact or the impacts related to transportation, uh, the plan established a traffic impact fee 
um, which was intended to uh, partially fund all of the transportation improvements that were going to support that new development. In addition to ensure that we saw growth in a balanced way throughout North San Jose, uh, all of the development was split into four phases, um, roughly sort of evenly split across four phases. Um, while the plan went into effect in 2005, development didn't uh, actually start occurring or entitlement didn't start occurring until late 2006, early 2007. Um, <clears throat> and at that point, we saw uh, an explosive amount of growth uh, opportunity through entitlement on both the office and residential market. Now, obviously, 2008, we saw the Great Recession, and following that, uh, what came back was essentially uh, the residential development. So we saw all 8,000 units in phase one develop uh, roughly by, till about, um, by about 2014. Um, but during that same period, we only saw about 3 million square feet of industrial development. Um, and so as a result, we've been behind the, uh, the phasing allotment uh, in North San Jose and unable to move forward. So uh, starting back in probably around 2013, 2014, City Council has been giving staff direction to look at North San Jose as an opportunity to facilitate new, uh, primarily residential growth in, in the city, but also new employment growth. Um, the, the staff has looked at a number of different paths of, of doing this, but the approach really crystallized through the adoption of the Housing Crisis Work Plan in 2018. Uh, North San Jose represents about 24,000 units, um, so it's an important part of providing uh, new housing throughout the city. In addition, uh, the context on how we do CEQA clearance and CEQA analysis for transportation improvements changed in 2019 when the state adopted SB 743, um, which was the change to vehicle miles traveled. Um, the additional sort of contextual pieces that have changed around this are really facilitating our need to make amendments at this time. Uh, and many of the new state housing laws, including SB uh, 330 and SB 1333, which require us to uh, Think about how we implement housing in different ways and also ensure that our general plan and zoning are aligned. And then obviously in addition, uh, we're going through the process on the update of our uh, housing element in the general plan uh, and meeting the needs of our regional housing needs allocation, our RENA numbers. Um, and in doing so, we need to identify sites throughout the city to, to meet that allocation. Uh, and as a result, North San Jose is playing an important part of those solutions. So just to provide some clarity uh, on exactly what we're, we're doing today, the actions before you, there are a number of different actions. Um, and we, we've referred to it in many of the updates at committee and council in different ways. Um, we often talk about retiring the policy um, or retiring the plan. But we wanted to be clear on, on actually what the, the actions that we're taking today are. So firstly, uh, we're amending the general plan. Um, we need to remove references to the policy itself, because right now it's currently embedded in our 2040 general plan. Um, we're making some amendments to uh, the densities throughout North San Jose. There's been some challenges on the implementation uh, where we've not achieved as much housing throughout the areas that we designated um, over the past uh, or since 2005. Um, and as a result, we're going to increase uh, how we look at density um, and what the minimums for those density are and how we consider housing throughout the area. Um, <clears throat> and we're also going to amend, so the policy will still continue to exist. It will still exist as a policy but we're going to limit its application to only previously entitled projects um, or, or development that's come through. So it will not be applicable to new developments moving forward. In addition, uh, as per SB 1333, we need to ensure that our zoning ordinance meets uh, and matches our general plan. So right now we don't have the transit employment residential overlay district uh, codified in the zoning code. So, uh, so we're going to do that and include that as a reference. And then lastly, we're making amendments, obviously, to ensure that the traffic impact fee that was established through the policy only applies to projects that have been previously entitled. So those projects that exist that have been entitled but yet, but yet to be built in North San Jose will still have a, a fee applicable to them, but it will not apply to new future projects that will be required to do their own CEQA clearance under the new standard. Um, obviously, there's been a, a number of different opportunities for us to engage with stakeholders, residents, and businesses throughout the area. And um, we did hold a couple of community meetings uh, last year to talk about this more broadly. Um, there's been uh, a number of different presentations to the developer and construction roundtable. And um, we've met pretty consistently with the River Oaks Neighborhood Association, who've been engaged in the North San Jose planning efforts from way before uh, the adoption of the plan in 2005. And in addition, we've been doing targeted small stakeholder outreach with different property owners, developers, 
uh, and interested stakeholder groups throughout the last few years. And with this, I'm going to hand over to Michael to talk to our next step. Thank you, Chris. Michael Brio, Deputy Director of Citywide Planning. So um, the North San Jose process, the quote retirement process we're talking about today is really the first step in a two-step process. Um, the second step, I'm going to talk about both of these, but it's to identify additional housing sites for both market rate and affordable, and also to develop an affordable housing strategy. So step number, the first step is, is, is identifying more housing sites. So the council, the actions that you are considering today will unlock a significant amount of housing capacity in North San Jose, but it will not um, allow the development of housing to achieve the full 32,000 housing units uh, that were planned in North San Jose or our plan in the general plan. And there's a couple of reasons for this. One is that the North San Jose ADP, Area Development Policy, didn't actually identify enough sites to get to the full amount of 32,000 housing units. In addition, much of the um, residential development has occurred was at a lower density than, than hoped for and, and anticipated. The, the second reason is that the core area, which is in blue on the map there, which is basically from Montague down to 101 on North 1st Street, um, while it does housing, 6,000 housing units were um, envisioned in the, in the North San Jose Area Development Policy, the current general plan framework doesn't, general plan does not have a framework to accommodate that development. So we'll need to work on um, developing that framework in North San Jose. Um, so, I mean, the big part of this, this picture it, that we're talking about is we need to go out and we need to find more sites for housing for both market rate and affordable. In some cases, it's because the existing sites that are in the North San Jose area development policy are moving forward with commercial and industrial development. So it doesn't make sense to, to keep the housing overlay on them, but to relocate them to other locations. Um, as part of this process, we are going to look at shifting some of the locations, largely because of, of this pending development. In addition, we do need to uh, amend or, or propose that uh, or recommend to council that they amend the North, the Rincon South uh, Urban Village Plan, formerly known as the Specific Plan because the heights in there are very, very low in the area that's planned for housing. The heights are actually around four stories, and that's uh, sort of high density as envisioned in 1998, but not where we are today. So all of these actions are really needed to get us the full 32,000 housing units, both um, for market rate and affordable housing. The other related step, and these are very much intertwined, is developing an affordable housing strategy. So the area development policy currently has a goal that 20% of the housing in North San Jose will be affordable to low income households. And um, we're proposing to maintain that goal and, 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 and we need to come up with a strategy of how we're gonna get there. Um, so there's different things that, that the housing department working with its CSA partners are going to explore, including targeting um, land purchase in North, in land purchases for affordable housing in North San Jose and focusing our, our funding to subsidize affordable housing in North San Jose as well. The other, um, the other action item is to, is to create an, uh, an affordable housing implementation plan that would be very similar to what has been done for the Deerdon Station area that will really identify the tools, the, the steps and the locations to get us to, to get to to achieve the goal of 20% of the units being affordable. Some other things that the strategy will explore is, um, is the feasibility of modifying inclusionary housing and density bonus um, to, to, further, uh, to further incent affordable housing, specifically in North San Jose, and to explore additional incentives for affordable housing that could be possible in North San Jose. Related to the affordable housing strategy are some land use actions that we're recommending. So one is to develop a housing, an affordable housing overlay. It's not something we have now. Um, we do have uh, overlays uh, in the general plan and we're proposing an overlay today for housing in general. In, but this would be an overlay that would um, limit or restrict land for affordable housing. So as we identify sites that make sense for affordable, those sites, would, if residential would be is going to be built on that site, it would have to be 100% affordable, or on very, very large sites, because many of the sites in North San Jose are 10, 15, 20 acre sites. 
that it would restrict that a, a significant portion of the um, property would have to be affordable, allowing the rest to go to market rate. This is to, this would be an overlay, so it would allow the underlying it would allow development to occur under the underlying land use designation. So most of the sites in North San Jose are designated industrial park that allows office industrial R and D. Those uses would still be allowed. This would just be giving an additional opportunity for affordable housing in North San Jose. We do think this is actually one of the most meaningful um, and, and prag pragmatically the most effective tool that we can do to incent affordable housing in North San Jose. Um, so when we, as we identify sites bo both for market rate and affordable, um, they will be part of the housing element. Um, so they will they will be included as as um, as the sites that are needed to get to our, our arena goal of sixty two thousand housing units being built in the next um, eight year housing element cycle. So as we look at sites that make sense in North San Jose for affordable, we are going to examine the feasibility of of um, we're going to examine the funding sources to understand if we pick this site how competitive it would it be with other affordable housing proposals. We also need to test the fair housing implications of different sites to ensure that we're furthering um, fair housing for state law requirements in the housing element. So some of the timelines I'll just quickly cover is in June of 2022, as part of the housing draft housing element, we will be releasing draft housing sites, both uh, housing sites in general and affordable housing sites in North San Jose. Um, we'll, we also be re, uh, releasing um, a, basically a work program that goes in the draft housing element um, that identifies actions that the city should take. So there'll be actions in there related to North San Jose specifically to further further to further affordable housing in North San Jose. So that will be going live. Public draft will come out at the end of June. In the summer of 2022, we're proposing to return a council for discussion on recommended changes to the land use framework. So we're talking a lot about this in generalities today, but we wanna come back to you and specifically share with you, get your thoughts and discuss with you on what specifically we're proposing. And also identify some, dig into a discussion more on a, a potential affordable housing strategy. In early 2023, um, staff, more specifically the housing department will return to council with a draft North San Jose affordable housing implementation plan Again, this is the plan that would be modeled after um, the work that the plan that's been done in the Deeron Station area. And then in April 2023, as part of the housing element process, we would be bringing to council on North San Jose, additional North San Jose general plan and zoning code amendments for affordable and market rate housing. Um, and then council would consider uh, adoption of the housing element at that time as well. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to David, who's gonna talk about the CEQA that was done for this, this process. Thank you, Michael. David Keown, Principal Planner, and Planning, Building, and Code Enforcement. So first of all, I wanna mention that for this project, we did for the North San Jose amendments. We prepared an initial study addendum to the general plan EIR and supplemental EIR. Um, this is because North San Jose is an identified growth area within general plan and the major roadway network improvements have been incorporated into the transportation diagram in the general plan. Yeah. So, okay. Furthermore, the development capacity in North San Jose is it? Okay. There we go. <laughs> the development capacity in North San Jose is also incorporated into the general plan growth at build out, and that remains unchanged by the project. Um, therefore, the North San Jose amendments will not result in any new significant environmental impacts or an increase in the severity of previously identified environmental impacts in the general plan EIR and supplemental EIR. Therefore, the city determined that an addendum is appropriate. The initial study and addendum was posted to the city's website on March 17, 2022, and all interested parties were notified. In response to the initial study addendum and the settlement agreement, the County of Santa Clara submitted a letter at nine o'clock this morning. Um, this responding to this letter, we want to reiterate um, the main concerns regarding the mitigation measures and phasing in the North San Jose Area Development Policy EIR. Um, again, as stated in the initial study addendum and within 
all the documentation, including the staff report and other documentation for the project. Since 2020, July 1st, 2020, level of service traffic congestion is no longer a valid metric for evaluating transportation impacts under the California Environmental Quality Act, CEQA. This is pursuant to State Bill 743 and also is backed up by recent case law. The 2005 North San Jose EIR is based on level of service and therefore is no longer valid with the implementation of 740, SB 743, is no longer valid for providing CEQA clearance for projects going forward in within the North San Jose area. Therefore, projects going forward under in this area will have to prepare their own project-specific environmental clearance and vehicle miles, and excuse me, transportation analysis under vehicle miles traveled. This will be required to implement, if, if impacts are identified, will be required to implement mitigation measures pursuant to reducing vehicle miles traveled and not traffic congestion. These types of improvements will be very different than the improvements that originally identified in 2005. That concludes my presentation and I'm available to answer any questions. Good afternoon, Nancy Klein, Office of Economic Development and Cultural Affairs. And we're going to share a little bit of information about the proposed settlement agreement with the city of Santa Clara and wanting to note that over the last many months, City of San Jose staff have had multiple conversations with the City of Santa Clara and the county staff on subjects including the housing crisis, VMT changes in law and implementation, close out of the North San Jose plan and associated impacts and funding. The settlement agreement was formulated as a three-party agreement intended to be both with the city of Santa Clara and the county of Santa Clara. The settlement agreement before you allocates funding to the city of Santa Clara and to the county of Santa Clara. Staff remains optimistic about reaching agreement with the county of Santa Clara. If we cannot come to agreement with the county, the city will likely need to make minor changes to clarify that the settlement agreement before you today is a two-party agreement and addresses concerns by the county that we are doing in amending the existing settlement agreement. In the agreement, San Jose agrees to pay a total of $1.5 million to the County of Santa Clara for the Montague I-880 interchange. This will address one of the settlement's terms in the original settlement agreement and the county's desire to have the city help fund Measure B project. The $1.5 million will be subject to a separate agreement with the County of Santa Clara. In addition, $9 million will be expended by the City of San Jose for construction of Montague widening to eight lanes over the Guadalupe River from First Street to Lick Mill. And Montague, as many of you know, is a county highway facility. Finally, the $28 million that will be expended to complete improvements included in the Complete Streets Plan of 2021 as adopted by the Valley Transportation Authority, improvements to the Mon Montague Expressway and North First Street through investment in $9.34 million in improvements in the City of San Jose, $9.33 million for improvements in the city of Santa Clara, and these funds will be paid to the city of Santa Clara, and $9.33 million paid to the county of Santa Clara, again, subject to a separate agreement with the county. You see additional points below that are part of the implementation strategy for the settlement agreement, and beyond that, I would just like to remind or point out that in total, the investment by the city of San Jose that's being discussed today 
is $38.5 million for improvements, and staff looks forward to fruitful discussions with the county that allow housing and affordable housing particular to move forward. With that, staff is available for questions. Thank you. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I'm just gonna run through uh, very quickly. Um, this, the rec there's a number of recommendations. The first, I think it's the first one here. One of the one of the actions, the first one is going to be the settlement agreement. Uh, so it's been pr the the recommendation is approve and amend settlement agreement between the C city of Santa Clara and the city of San Jose related to North San Jose. And then there are a number of other actions um, or recommendations that the planning commission made on, to council. that are consistent with staff's recommendation. They include adopting an addendum to the general the general plan EAR, accepting a, the North San Jose transportation impact fee plan update, adopt a resolution for a number of general plan amendments related to North San Jose, approve an ordinance um, amendment to Title 20, adding um, the tarot overlay, and approving an ordinance to Title um, 14 related to changes to the traffic impact fee. And that concludes um, staff presentation and we're available for questions. Thank you, everybody. Uh, let's go to the public first for public comment on the agreement with City of Santa Clara. That's 10.2A. We'll have public comment, then council deliberation, and a vote <laughs> on that item, and then we'll take on the remainder. Christopher? Uh, my comments will include um, both items under 10.2. Christopher Chelladin, lead deputy county council, office of the county council on behalf of the county of Santa Clara. Thank you, honorable mayor and council members for the opportunity. Um, as you all know, county council, James Williams submitted a letter late on Friday and I submitted a more lengthy comment letter this morning. And I'm not gonna repeat all the points in both letters, uh, but I would like to highlight the following. Um, as we've done numerous times, we'd really like a request for a more meaningful continuance of the city, county and city of Santa Clara can negotiate and explore whether a settlement agreement amendment can be achieved that would meet the needs of all of the parties. Uh, we asked for a continuance of at least two months and that request was uh, rejected. Uh, we think a continuance to a date uncertain would be more appropriate. Um, in addition, as we've indicated to the city attorney's office, uh, we've been working diligently with our consultant WSP to evaluate the city's initial proposal, specifically a uh, deletion of the Trimble flyover as well as to come up with some creative alternatives to the current requirements in the settlement agreement. Um, our office, uh, who would have to be intimately involved in any uh, negotiation, uh, was only notified of these issues formally in early March, um, and a few weeks is simply not enough time to have meaningful set settlement conversations in light of the long-term complexity of the issues, and especially because we would need to go to our Board of Supervisors uh, for any kind of discussion on a specific proposal. Um, as uh, stated in our letter, of course, the county supports the production of housing as de demonstrated by the county's nearly $1 billion program approved by the voters to provide affordable su supportive housing opportunities. Um, however, the county's sincere hope is that large scale residential development in North San Jose can be accomplished without further exacerbating traffic impacts on the county's Montague Expressway. That was the intent of the settlement agreement in 2006 that resolved the litigation in which the county and other cities prevailed and should be a guiding principle for any settlement agreement. Blair Beekman. Hi, thank you. Uh, Blair Beekman here. It's interesting that people of the uh, city of Santa Clara are here today. Thank you. Um, uh, you know, being an outsider, I hope I can help in, in, in however I can uh, for all sides on this matter. Um, you know, it's always been my opinion that uh, the city of Santa Clara and San Jose, they've done some really remarkable work with affordable housing ideas and mixed income ideas. And, you know, they, they, they've worked together, uh, albeit it was in fighting terms, but they reached some really interesting ideas, what really can be good examples of the future of mixed income housing that I think offers an amazing choices and flexibility and how we will be gauging the future of affordable housing issues for our future and how we talk about uh, our neighborhoods uh, as a shared process. Uh, it, it simply it offers a lot of good choices for us that uh, 
I hope uh, can really help this uh, negotiation process that you're in right now. Um, another factor is is with transportation and 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 say like the Stevens Creek uh, you know uh, transit corridor planning. Um, that you know that that's the future of uh, technology use, and I and I, just a hopeful reminder that in the importance of what open public policies and its accountability can do for the entire process. You're going to have a ton of geofencing questions that are going to be involved in this future of, of transit issues along the uh, Stevens Creek corridor. To have open and accountable practices is 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 vital to what is our future of sustainability, open democracy. Uh, good community practices and ideas of peace. It's a community working together, and it isn't government, you know, handing down, you know, certain things to the public. It's a shared process. Good luck in those sort of efforts. Matthew Reed. Yes, good afternoon, Mayor, Council, and staff. Matthew Reed, Silicon Valley at home. I'm here today to ask that as you retire the current policy, you explicitly support policies and land use tools that will make it feasible and realistic to meet the original requirement that 20% of the housing built in the plan area be affordable. We support the memorandum from Mayor Licardo, Council Member Cohen, and Council Member Perales, and appreciate their collective leadership and commitment. We also support the recommendation for increases in the minimum residential densities contained in the memo. North San Jose must be built for the future not our lower density past. We also want to speak briefly on the letter received from the county, uh, which traditionally we would not do. This has been a very long, frustrating process. We support the city moving forward with this plan. We're excited to see the resolution, City of Santa Clara. This is too important and the regional needs are too great to allow for it to continue to flounder. We are optimistic the remaining issues can be resolved. We appreciate staff's presentation today, outlining the range of steps to ensure that we remain committed to a North San Jose that develops equitably and is accessible to all of San Jose's residents and future residents and employees. It's important to acknowledge that this has been a long process and we feel, feel really positive about the engagement recently with staff on these questions. We are looking for explicit housing policies that center equity and inclusion and the redevelopment of North San Jose. This won't be easy, but with focus, we can leverage the tools and make it a reality. This council must stay committed and ensure that it remains a staff priority to expand housing opportunities throughout the city. We are prepared to support this work going forward. Thank you. Vince? Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. I'm Vince Rocha, Vice President of Housing and Community Development with the Silicon Valley Leadership Group. We request that you support the settlement agreement before you. This evening, we've heard a presentation about the retirement of the North San Jose Area Development Plan, changes to state law regarding SB 30, BMT, CEQA, the settlement agreement. The set of policy issues may seem rather complex, but the goal is simple. It's about people. It's about housing for people. It's about jobs for people. It's about development in a smart way near our public transit in North San Jose. The staff has worked tirelessly on our resolution of this settlement, and now is the time to move forward with this plan. Thank you. Holly. Good afternoon, Mayor and San Jose City Council members. My name is Ali Saperman, and I'm here on behalf of the Housing Action Coalition. As we all know, we need to dramatically increase the supply of housing, particularly housing that is near transit, near existing jobs, and affordable to working people who make our communities work. That is why I'm here to speak in support of item 10.2 to call to the end of the threats of lawsuits from Santa Clara County that is stopping the construction of vitally needed new housing in North San Jose. I wanna thank the mayor of the city council and the city staff for your leadership in this process. Supporting the settlement agreement is a milestone for San Jose and I encourage everyone to move things forward so we can build the housing we desperately need. Thank you so much. Erica. Good afternoon, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and City Council members. My name is Erica Pinto, San Jose Planning Policy Manager with SPUR. 
Speaking on this ag agenda item as a whole, we appreciate the work done by city staff and partners to continue planning for housing production in one of the largest potential areas to accommodate new housing units in the city of San Jose. But given that the city, that the council's adoption of this proposed policy change will retire the ADP's current affordable housing goal of 20% for residential development, we support recommendations from staff to ensure that measures and resources are given during this ongoing process that will enable greater production of housing, both market rate and affordable in neighborhoods near transit and jobs. In order to meet the housing crisis, the city must be bold about pursuing strategies to increase the amount of, again, market rate and affordable housing sites across the city. Existing plans and codes need to be amended in order to accommodate new growth and facilitate equitable development. In other words, in order to support great neighborhoods, the city needs to intentionally plan for a mix of housing, commercial and industrial spaces alongside public space to attract both new jobs and residents. It is necessary for all parties involved in updating this area development policy to work together under shared values and a commitment to building housing for all income levels in North San Jose. It is our hope that by taking these critical steps to address our chronic housing, short, housing shortage, San Jose will effectively plan for more livable and equitable communities. Thank you. Catalyze SV. Good afternoon, Council. This is Alex Shore, Executive Director of Catalyze SV, supporting these other community advocates from SPUR, SVLG, SV at Home, and probably more to come, and more who have written you in the last day or so, to try and continue to hold the line and go even further in North San Jose. First of all, to go further by building density. I grew up in this valley, but I feel very strongly that it needs to change in order to continue to prosper. And that change requires greater building heights in select areas, particularly near transit and along commercial corridors. Kudos to the mayor, council member Cohen and council member Perales for leading this charge, for continuing to emphasize affordable housing I do know in your hearts that you care deeply about this issue and you are moving the needle by continuing to encourage the planning department, the community and other parts of the city to go higher and higher buildings is not as scary as it sounds. It can be really great for neighborhoods. It can offer more opportunity for green space and amenities and perhaps most importantly, more places for more of our existing and future community members to live. So thank you to all those council members and the mayor for who may be supporting this today. Love that memo that you all put out and hope that more will support it, as well as the goal of 20% affordable housing. It is the housing we most desperately need, as you know from the housing reports that you're receiving and continuing to place that emphasis on it will be really incredibly crucial in the months and years ahead. Thank you so much. Mary? Wait, hit the unmute button always helps. Can you hear me? Um, I'm the 35-year uh, CEO of EAH Housing. We've been developing in San Jose for many, many years. And uh, I'm now the executive chair of the board. Of, in my tenure there, we've developed over 800 units and we manage another 1,200 units in the area. And it is really a pleasure to see what you're putting forward here. We fully support um, the settlement with, San, with Santa Clara. And also, I just would like to stress the extreme need for higher density. The previous speaker just mentioned going taller. And I, I don't drive by any building I've built in 30 years that I wish I hadn't made four stories deeper. When you look at the growth of homelessness and the, you know, the one way, best way to stop homelessness is to have housing that's affordable for as many people as possible. And you're in a unique position with this new area um, to create housing that's of high density and very high quality and affordable and for meeting your 20% um, ratio that you've been discussing, um, which is critical. I'd aim higher than 20% if possible, given the situation with trying to stem the tide of homelessness, which is so critical. So we really deeply appreciate your support for this measure and all the work that uh, the council has put into this and the staff. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor Licardo, 
Vice Mayor Jones and members of the council. My name is Scott Udall with the Hanover Company. Speaking today on behalf of our development partners and project team for Zero Sealy Avenue. This project seeks to deliver over 1,400 homes and apartments at the corner of Sealy and Montague Expressway, including 172 affordable units on top of over 50,000 square feet <clears throat> of new ground floor grocery anchored retail. These buildings will be centered on a two and a half acre city park and feature, feature linkage points to the adjacent Coyote Creek Trail. Having worked on this project for a few years already, we are excited to see the city reaching this milestone today, which is a culmination of many, many years of hard work from the city staff. We agree with and wholeheartedly support the recommendation from Mayor Licardo, Council Member Cohen, and Council Member Perales, and we thank them for their leadership for addressing our regional housing needs here in North San Jose. Finally, we express our hope that the city of San Jose and the County of Santa Clara will continue to negotiate in good faith and find resolution of any outstanding issues. As a large mixed use housing project adjacent to Montague Expressway, we look forward to continuing to work with both the city staff and county roads and airports on traffic connections that will allow the planned retail to thrive. Thank you for your time. Jill. Thank you. This is Jill Borders, and I wanted to just comment on the letter from the community groups and nonprofit groups that really something that caught my eye and that I just want to point out. It said that when North San Jose was opened up for new housing development nearly two dec decades ago, it was intended to be a transit and job rich new community accessible to everyone in San Jose. To realize this vision, the North San Jose area development policy stated that 20% of all new homes would be affordable. This did not happen in phase one. The policy was not followed. North San Jose was built as an exclusive community. Now, I don't know this for a fact. I'm reading this from these, a number of groups. I mean, it looks like there's at least 15 listed. And as a resident and taxpayer here, and I read that because I'm not an expert in North San Jose, you know, in those affairs and that plan that's being retired. But when it says that there was a policy that 20% of all those new homes would be affordable, and the next sentence, this did not happen in phase one, all I can think about is all of the people suffering they're unhoused. And I keep thinking, well, 20% of 8,000 rough, right, is what? 1,600 units of affordable housing. And so the next thing I think about is an entire planning commission and an entire city council that at some point voted in favor of all those 8,000 units without any affordable housing. So the question is, who's accountable for that decision, those decisions? Who said it was okay to not have 20% of those projects include affordable housing? I know it's extremely complex. I know there are reasons why. But this is why we're where we, where we are today and why the frustrate public like me is so frustrated. Um, I had no idea that was exactly part of that plan, but apparently it was and it wasn't followed and somebody should be responsible. Drives me nuts. Eric? Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mayor Licardo, members of the council. My name is Eric Shainauer. I represent a number of projects in the North San Jose area and uh, first wanted to speak to <clears throat> the need to have public agencies getting along and solving their disagreements. Um, as long as there are disagreements, there will be a cloud over North San Jose that may cause developers to either delay or drop development projects. Uh, even if the issues of disagreement are tangential <laughs> to new development projects, just the fact that there is that risk of litigation between two public agencies um, represents risk. And what that would mean is that projects that are on the table right now could be delayed or dropped, that have affordable housing in them, they have market rate housing in them, they have neighborhood serving retail in them, they have neighborhood serving parks in them. And so the disagreement could cause those good things, affordable housing, parks and retail to be delayed or deferred indefinitely. So settlement is something that should be achieved in short order. The other um, key point is we have projects that are well down 
the entitlement process in the city. So in the future, if the council chooses to change the standards within the policies for North San Jose, uh, it is important to address pipeline projects and grandfather them under the rules in which they started. Do not change the rules midstream on projects that are well underway. That could be very disruptive to the process. So thank you to Council Member Licardo, Council Member Cohen, Council Member Perales, I'm sorry, Mayor Licardo, uh, for your leadership and your memo. Back to the council. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank all the members of the community uh, for speaking, as well as uh, for the many letters we received. A uh, letter from you know, Matthew Reed and took on Valley at Home and a coalition of 19 organizations uh, supporting housing and urbanism uh, in our city and, and environmental planning. Uh, Spur also submitted a letter. Appreciate their support um, and uh, and the focus of all those organizations on affordability, of course. Uh, also recognize we received an email from Gene Marlowe, the president of the Rona River Parks Parkway, uh, concerned about density issues and confident we'll have a lot of public discussion prior to any projects that are approved about specific densities and, and heights and so forth. Uh, but I thank everyone for their engagement. Uh, and I know, of course, there were letters as well from the county center there. I'll just as shortly, I, I, I do want to thank our team here at the city for their hard work, um, Chris and Michael and David and everybody in planning, and uh, Nancy and her team at OED, uh, Ramses and, and John at Harbor Transportation, and, and Johnny and Nora here at the city attorney's office, and Rosen and, and the city manager's team. Uh, I know this has taken a lot of work uh, to get this over the goal line. Many, many conversations with uh, many stakeholders, including, of course, the city of Santa Clara and the county of Santa Clara, uh, going back four years. Uh, also, want to thank my colleagues, uh, council members uh, Cohen and, and Prowlis, uh for your partnership on the memorandum, as well as uh, Councilmember Mahan for his supportive memorandum as well. And uh, particularly thank uh, Councilmember uh, Cohen and, and Stacey Brown for their work uh, uh, in reaching out and collaborating uh, with the city and the county and others to, to do what we could to bring everybody along and particularly really want to thank the, the various members of the Santa Clara City Council who met with me and talked about the challenges we have with housing in our region and uh, who expressed their willingness to say, think about how we can move forward together in a different way. Um, Council members uh, Suds Jane and Karen Hardy, Kevin Park, Anthony Becker, Raisha Hall appreciated their willingness to um, to think differently about these uh, age old seems like age old disputes and how we uh, we really need to move beyond them so that we can build a valley that is uh, for everyone and far more affordable than it currently is. Um, so I appreciate uh, them and, and, and their teams uh, working with the city uh, collaboratively. Um, I had a couple of questions I'd like to ask uh, regarding where we're at um, as we think about going forward in our next steps. Um, One is just with regard to the impacts of SB 743. And now I think about, you know, the other 743, of course, relates to, I believe, the mandate that in the state that we now align ourselves with a vehicle miles travel approach to assessing um, impacts of development rather than a level of service. And when combined with the other state housing laws that have come down now, SB 330, SB 1333. I'm just wondering, with regard to all those projects that are not yet entitled under the current ADP, are we even able to comply with those laws if we were to continue to operate under the current area development plan? Or would essentially we just be running up against state legal prohibitions? Yeah, I think so under um, SB 330, um, and I'm not sure this gets to answering your question, but you can let us know, um, is that there is a question about, you know, there's there's a ban within 330 that precludes cities from having moratorium on housing development. 
Um, and there is, you know, interpretations that the current phasing that we have and restricting housing on sites that are already general planned for housing or have an overlay with housing may be seen as, as, as a violation of 330. So, right. I mean, there isn't, so that's something that, that could come up regardless what we're proposing today is to sort of that potential issue would go away because we'd be aligning we'd be allowing the housing to go forward on the sites that are already um, envisioned in the general plan to allow housing. So just to go a little deeper, just on that, that's just one of the three issues, and I agree that's an important one. Because the operation, the plan, with the interaction of all the surrounding contextual facts, we essentially have had a de facto prohibition on development of housing in North San Jose, but for, for about a decade, I assume since the last time we ever got a a unit out of the ground, is that right? That's right. Yeah. Okay, and so obviously, very serious concerns about whether or not that's even viable. And obviously, regardless of what we think the state policy is, it's it's horrible for our valley. Um, and now with with the mitigations that are required under SB seven forty three, I, I assume today under operations of seven forty three, we couldn't, for example elicit fees to go expand an expressway, could we? So under the mitigations associated with 743, um, it's highly unlikely, I'll, I'll let Ramses and John, if they want to jump in on that in one second. What I will say, Mayor, to the sort of bigger picture of your question, is that um, you know when we adopted the North San Jose Area Development Policy, we also uh, adopted a program level EIR that allowed us to move very quickly on development for that first period of time. Um, several years ago now, I think pre-pandemic, um, we determined that you know that that EIR had sort of passed its functional use for approving individual projects in the area. Right. Um, however, the the traffic impact fee is a mitigation fee act fee, so that that stays in place as part of the sort of offsetting mitigation under under LOS. So, should a project come forward today and the policy was still in full force and effect, they would essentially have to go through their own secret clearance. They would get a, a probably most likely a full EIR because of the VMT conditions in North San Jose. Um, they'd either have to mitigate appropriately or get a, an override uh, on the impact, and then they'd still have to pay the traffic impact fee in addition to that. Right. right? Because it's likely that the offsets related to those are, are very different. Um, the traffic impact fee is related specifically to transportation roadway improvements versus the sort of, sort of mitigations and offsets under VMT are, are sort of more aligned with transit and, and the sort of TDM type measures. I don't know, Ramses, if you want to add to the specifics. Okay. So for a whole host of reasons, we, we got to retire this plan. In addition to the fact that we're chained to a plan that's prohibiting us from building housing right now. But but for legal reasons, we, we need to move on. Is that fair to say? Uh, that's fair to say, yes. Okay. So appreciate the, the letter that's from the county and, and, and their their perspective, and I, I'm confident we can get to an agreement with the county. I'm very optimistic we can do that because I think we all care about building more housing uh, in our valley, and I, I know several members of the board who feel strongly about that. Um, so I'm, I'm very hopeful we're going to get to a resolution very soon. Um, I, I know there were a couple issues that were raised in letters. I read both letters. One w was a concern that we haven't specified a funding source for many of the traffic improvements in North San Jose. And I don't know exactly what communication, because I know we had a lot of communication. I saw, what, 18 times we, we met with them over four years, so there was a lot of communication. But I assume at some point in our document somewhere we refer to the Measure B program in 2016 and the funding that's been made available through that. Is, is that fair? Uh, Mayor John Risto, Director of Transportation. The quick answer is yes, we have provided that to the extent that we know all those funds. Yeah. Uh, primarily with Measure B is a is going to be a contributor to a very big project yet to be built that's in the settlement agreement. And I'm I, I'm assuming that when you were said in North San Jose, you're really referring to the settlement agreement. The area development policy has a whole bunch of other projects that we're moving forward on that that are, are still underway. We've got one in construction and we intend to move other ones, but the ones we're talking about probably today in these actions are the settlement agreement that focuses on Montague and yes, Measure B is a major contributor to that. Okay. I know VTA is working collaboratively with us on those and I know many of those projects are moving through the pipeline, both the agreement and 
for the plan. Um, I guess just a legal question around, nor I don't expect you to know this off the top of your head. Obviously, there's an agreement that the county is concerned as a party. Um, they take umbrage with us moving forward. I understand that. But in terms of asserting, uh, asserting that there is any congestion impact to the valley uh, with regard to any development moving forward, my understanding is that the county assigned the congestion management organization responsibility to VTA. They did that back in the 1990s, I believe. Um, so I don't know if we've looked at this yet, Johnny or Nora, but does the county have standing to sue over congestion impacts or would that have to be the VTA since they are the congestion management agency for this region? Um, Mayor, uh, thank you for that question. And we have not looked at that okay. and we would have to, um, and we certainly will. Thank okay. you. Thank you. And obviously, we don't we don't need to get there. We all hope. We hope this is all just going to be discussed and resolved, um, either through direct discussion or mediation. You know, but it just would be helpful to understand all that. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to respond. One of the speakers asked, you know, was it okay for us to vote for eight thousand units with without sufficient affordable housing? And I think there's a lot of context here that's really important. One of which I think we had an inclusionary requirement that was suspended in court, in court battles that, that the California Supreme Court for six years, if I recall correctly. There was a redevelopment requirement, though. Is that right? Yes, and, Mayor, that's true. It was the Palmer. Yeah, and th those projects did pay the redevelopment well, fee. There, I assume is that there, right? Mayor, you have to remember the, the timing, right? Okay. As we came out of the Great Recession, uh, redevelopment was shut down in 2011. Okay. And so um, the majority of the housing came in in that period between 2011 and the resolution of the Palmer case. Yeah. Uh, prior to us having the affordable housing impact fee in place. Right. Um, and there was there was a, a, a very sort of in-depth discussion at council at the time as we approached the limit on the first sort of cap on 8,000 units. Um, and a decision was made, you know, uh, through that process to allow development to move forward and push that obligation into later phases. Right. So this is Jackie. Yeah, Jackie. Or else ran the director of housing. And we did receive some fees um, during the first phase in our, and we allowed market rate development to go forward with that. And we also created some mixed income housing. I, I saw that Kristen had raised her hand as well. And so maybe she can provide just the additional detail. Thanks, Jackie. Kristen. Thanks, Jackie. Um, yeah, I wanted to just point out that it was not legal during that pursuant to that Palmer lawsuit to for us to effectuate inclusionary rental. Um, so the deals that went forward in North San Jose that were rental had satisfaction agreements that protected them from have any obligation of affordability payment of fees or having to integrate the units provided that they hit certain milestones of proceeding. And as Chris said, because we were in a recession, we just wanted to see some construction go forward. So basically the first um, seven to 8,000 units that were all rental got built out with no affordability. And what Jackie is referring to was we did enter into a negotiation to um, convey some of the set aside affordable capacity in the permitting pipeline, if you will, that we'd set aside for affordable and we agreed to let some market rate units use it and in return we got a little bit of money for that okay thank you thank you for the yes. reminder that the history lesson it's been a long time for me sure. yeah uh, lots of reasons yeah i so i appreciate we where we were able to get fees we got fees and we used them for affordable housing but we were precluded from imposing fees and inclusionary requirements in many cases because both we we're being sued and our inclusionary mandate was, um, I, I think by virtue of operation of uh, the courts, uh, suspended until the until the Supreme Court weighed in. Uh, and then the dissolution of the redevelopment agencies prevented us from, from being able to impose requirements. So uh, everybody's working under the best intentions. The challenge was we also wanted to build housing. Okay, so uh, let's move to council, council member Cohen. Uh, yeah, thank you. And I want to thank staff. We've been working a long time on this, as you know, uh, since I um, was first 
came into office, we've been talking about this. Um, it's been a priority of mine um, to, opening, to open development in North San Jose, and I've been working with pretty much everybody over here on my right on that um, since that time. Um, you know, North San Jose has long been the economic engine that drives our city, and we must preserve land for further economic growth. Um, but I'm also excited that it's going to become the main area for affordable housing development, and I'm very confident that we will change ways that we we're just talking about as far as affordable housing. Um, by opening North San Jose to more housing will help the city, county, and the entire region to address our severe housing shortage. Uh, we saw the results yesterday of the point in time homeless count, reminding us just how critical our failure to provide housing uh, has been. Um, we haven't been able to move the needle as much on, for, on ending homelessness as we'd like, but we haven't really been able to build affordable housing in lots of, and in, in certainly in this part of the city for a long time. Um, so I'm grateful to the city of Santa Clara for recognizing the benefits for all of us moving to the next phase uh, of this project. And I want to thank uh, Mayor Licardo for his partnership in engaging with the city of Santa Clara and their council members. I spoke, I had meetings with each of those council members as well over the past year, and we could tell it was clear when we held the joint press conference with a few of their council members, uh, I guess it was over a year ago now, um, that that they understood the regional benefit of of opening up the area to housing and, and they want to be a partner in that. Um, so the importance of this action today is that it enables developers of housing, both market rate and affordable, to begin the process of getting entitlements for their projects. Uh, there's so many, there are many housing developers who are watching today's meeting looking for the assurance that they can begin the process for the projects that they have in the pipeline. Um, and in fact, the first project, which will be a 100% affordable housing project of over 500 units, is on our agenda for next week. You'll all be very familiar with the address when you see it on the agenda next week uh, on Vista Montana. But we're very excited about that. When that project of over 520 units gets built, um, we'll, at, we'll, we'll be up from 0% to 6% affordable housing in the, out of the 8,500 units in North San Jose. So we'll be making progress towards our goal. And there are other de developers and other people we're talking to about projects in North San Jose that will be completely affordable and others with inclusionary affordable housing that are in the pipeline. So I'm optimistic we'll be able to achieve those goals. Um, it's unfortunate that we haven't been able to complete negotiations with Santa Clara County yet. Uh, it, I know that remains unsettling for some of these housing developers. Um, I worry that it will delay the start of the entitlement process. Um, I understand that. Uh, but I'm confident that just like we did with the city of Santa Clara, we'll be able to settle with the county of Santa Clara. Um, keeping in mind that because projects will start in t going through the process of entitlement next week and in the, in the months ahead, it'll be a long time before there's actually shovels in the ground and projects are being built. And there's lots of time in parallel for us to work with the county to settle. And I know that our team and the county's team will work to do that in an amicable way. And I, I think that we're, we all agree, the county and the city, um, in the importance of what we're doing. Um, so there's two actions. I have some more comments on the second action, but I'll save them till later. I know this is really about the settlement with Santa Clara. So I'm going to move approval of the settlement agreement as summarized in the staff supplemental memo dated May 13th. Second. All right, motion and second. All right, Council Member Mahan. Thanks, Mayor. And I'll also save most of my comments for the second vote here, but I, I do want to just add my thanks to uh, the mayor and his team, Council Member Cohen, Stacey Brown, and the D4 team, and, um, and staff. You all have worked many more hours than any of us, I know, to get us to this point. I, I think it's really exciting. I think the, the potential impact on housing, housing availability, housing costs in our region is really, really significant. And I think your efforts are just a testament to the fact that the world changes and we have to be constantly collaborating and working to find new solutions to meet the current need and, and the opportunity to build uh, more intensively near jobs, near transit is extremely exciting. And um, I, I just, I think this is a really great moment for our city. And I'll, I, I do have some comments on um, the second part of this, but I just wanted to also express my thanks. And I'm happy to second the motion and, and support the agreement moving forward. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Frost. Yeah, my question is actually for the second part, so I'll wait as well. Okay. 
I already asked questions on the second part, so if you guys want to get out there, go ahead. But no, you want to wait? I'll go for it. Sure, fine. Okay. Um, so curious, I know in the presentation, uh, staff uh, denoted 20% affordable housing in all future development. The Obviously, the prior commitment was 20% of all the development in the area. So I just wanted to clarify what the what what was intended on that yeah i'm sorry that was a typo the intention is that the 20 percent of the full 32,000 housing units should be affordable not 20 percent of the new because we have we have to make up for the, the the lack of affordable housing building that happened when we allowed the 8,000 mark the weight units to go forward. okay that's why obviously that's our intent from the memo and as councilmember cohen just pointed out actually We'll, we'll we'll make some headway into that. Um, so and, and and that's the the goal. So and I just want to clarify that. Uh, maybe you could make an edit to the the um, presentation and then exchange that online. So that way, if anybody you know next week or something looks at that, that's that's what exists in there versus what was what was here today. So to to clarify that. Thanks. Okay, and just clarification, the motion, Councilor. Cohen was not on either the memoranda, it was just on the agreement. Is that right? I mean, it should be the same thing as item item A in 10.2A, uh -huh. which covers the agreement, which is in the memoranda from last, the full agreement is in the memoranda from last Friday, May 13th. Okay. Does that cover everything we need to move? Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, Councilman Mayheim. It, Mayor, do you want to vote on that and then have further discussion on the rest of the item? Yeah, we're going to have further let's discussion. Let's do that then. Okay, sorry. All right, uh, let's vote. All right, that passes. So now we are going to consider all the other stuff which is defined as everything from 10.2B uh, and following. <laughs> so um, let's go to public comment first, which is, this is again on the North San Jose. Uh, this would be the portion relating to the plan retirement, um, the amendment, the general plan and the Area Development Policy, Amendment to Title 20, and Amendment to Title 14. Christopher. Thank you, Christopher Chelden, Lead Deputy County Council. I wasn't sure if we were gonna have another opportunity to speak. I'll make this brief. Um, I just wanna reiterate that the county's concerned if the city moves forward with the amendments, um, we're gonna waste valuable public resources in adversarial proceedings rather than putting them to a more productive use. Um, in addition, I would note even with the response to our CEQA letter of earlier today, um, there was no mention in the staff's response regarding the, even the existence of the settlement agreement and how it impacts mitigation measures. And I would just emphasize that those mitigation measures were done after a successful CEQA challenge. Um, and you know, it would be really terrible public policy for um, you know, litigants who enter into settlement agreements to have people um, not you know, continue further discussions to try to work them out as opposed to going back to that adversarial uh, procedure. Um, and in addition, you know, basically anyone that knows San Jose would say that um, it's a housing rich city and a jobs poor city. And uh, we also wonder where the fiscal impact analysis is um, that supports all of this housing relative to, um, you know, the, the general um, idea of, jo of the jobs ha housing balance. So. Um, again, I, I appreciate the opportunity to speak again. Um, we're asking for what we think is a very reasonable and prudent request uh, for uh, the council to just wait, not take action today and allow us to continue our uh, further production, uh, productive discussions. Uh, thank you very much. Blair. Hi, thank you, Blair Beekman. Um, to quickly offer the one item I didn't quite mention uh, for this sort of work, that you're that you're doing at this time, uh, we have to really be considering uh, sea level rise issues and climate change issues for the future building of this area. Um, good luck that this can be an open conversation. We don't have to fear this sort of conversation. I mean, this is kind of the point of view I'm trying to come from is where where we can work together and on on items and that can be an important concept uh, is, is how we can talk about 
sea level rise issues in this area openly. And, um, you know, we did, uh, the VTA did a lot of important work towards the future of green sustainability and climate change uh, in the past few years, uh, I think before COVID, especially right before COVID and, and in the beginning times of COVID, that was a real heroic attempt. They wanted to really address, really address the future of housing in, in, in climate change terms. And uh, so good luck. Uh, maybe some advice from them can be helpful for all of us at this time. They can, they can offer some advice. Uh, you know, good luck how you can uh, work on these sort of issues uh, and, and work out our differences. Um, yeah, climate change is a big one, green sustainability and, and to be able to uh, acknowledge the sea level rise issues in, in this area, it's important to ourselves that we all need to learn how to do better. Good luck in your efforts uh, with this item. Council. Thank you. All right, back to the council. Council member Cohen. Yeah, thank you. On to part two. <laughs> um, as we've been talking about, it's unfortunate that the first 8,000 units of housing in North San Jose um, didn't include affordable housing, and we must uh, correct that. And it's why the recommendation, one of the recommendations in the memo from the mayor and Councilman Perales and myself um, is to commit to achieving 20% affordable housing for all projects moving, for the, for the sum total of all projects in North San Jose. That's getting us to 32,000. Uh, housing units in North San Jose um, with, I've done the math in my head, with 6,000 units that are affordable in that area. So I, I think it's doable. I think we're, we have, we're on the right track to getting there. And I um, believe um, that, that the, we, I'm excited to hear that you're planning to bring back by next spring some recommendations on how we're going to achieve that and what overlays we need to do that. Although it's possible that we'll already have some great progress towards that goal by next spring anyway. Um, and we'll have some exciting things to talk about before then. Um, we also need to make sure we maximize density um, as we build, especially if we're gonna be converting some of our commercial space in North San Jose, we ought to do that and, and uh, maximize density. That's why the other item on our memo is about the density level and the recommendation from staff was that 75 units, but we think there's areas in the North San Jose particularly in the T row area that can, can can have 100 as the minimum density. And we ought to consider how we can achieve that and what areas are appropriate for that density. Um, I have uh, have long said that North San Jose is an area of the city that can support taller buildings and higher density. And while we did do some great, have some great um, apartment complexes in North San Jose now, I wish they had been a little taller and we had gotten some more um, apartments out of the ones that were built there. Uh, we should also, while we consider the housing overlay, think about how we can do mixed use development. So we're not necessarily sacrificing all of our commercial land, but doing things in a, in a mixed use way. Um, I did see a uh, project in the Mercury News outlined this week that's actually in District 3, not District 4, but in uh, along North 1st Street, some creative use of space, putting housing on top of parking and other, other types of, uh, of retail and commercial space there. And those are the kind of things we ought to be looking to try to do all, along all of North First Street. And that's particularly important because we also need to bring amenities to North San Jose. It really is an under, I don't know what the word is, under amenitized area. Um, we don't have a community center, a library, or a grocery store in all of North San Jose. And if we do get to 32,000 housing units, we're gonna need those things. It's gonna be done differently in North San Jose. It's not gonna be a standalone library maybe. It will probably be a library in the first floor of one of these developments. Um, but I believe we're gonna have to to, to be focused on those amenities in addition to the housing. Um, so I want to thank, um, you know, Council Member Perales partnership on this. I, we, we share North San Jose. Um, a lot of it's in D4, but a, a decent portion is also in D3. And it's important that we have a unified voice on, on this importance. Certainly want to thank Mayor Licardo. We've worked a lot on this since uh, the beginning of last year. Um, we've gotten to this point. I'm, I'm glad that we'll be able to do that and move forward with some of the projects. Um, I think I covered the items in the memo that we wrote. Um, I want to move the memo that we wrote, which includes staff recommendations. Um, it includes uh, the section on um, potentially increasing the minimum density um, in, in, in the T-Row area, and also 
focus on making sure that all of the housing is 20 per, at least 20 percent of all the housing in north san jose is affordable and some suggestions on how we might do that as we move forward and then i want to thank councilor mahan for his uh comments about uh the importance of working with the county um i do want to say that i don't despite the uh, um county council's comments today i don't think that passing this this plan necessitates an adversarial posture. I think that we're still in the midst of a negotiation um, because of the timing of the projects that we have coming and the importance of getting started on them. It's important that we pass this today, but that doesn't mean that we were not, we were planning to change anything about the negotiations we were in the middle of doing. Um, and we just, we just feel that we can continue to move in that direction. And, and while I know that staff uh, you know, the um, city manager's office and the city attorney's office were already planning to have these conversations and reach out to the county, putting that into the motion to ensure that there's a uh, plan to move forward with a conversation between the county and the city is, is enumerated here in the motion. So I'll add the language in Councilman Mahan's memo um, address, pushing the city manager's office to set up that next round of talks. Second. And city attorney. And city attorney, right. <laughs> okay, is there a second? Second. Or did, sorry, did you second? Yeah, this way. Yeah. Okay, so second was with Councilor Frost. Okay, uh, Councilor Mahan. Yeah, thank you for including my memo. And I, I just wanted to add, you know, I was really disappointed and, and concerned by, by the letters we received from the county just over the last few days. I, I don't think the threat of further lawsuit is uh, particularly productive at this point. I mean, we've been we've been stuck on an old dispute for a very long time that's frankly rooted in a different era, an era in which we did not have nearly the housing crisis we have today. We did not have the number of people living on our streets that we have today. Our concerns and understanding of the climate crisis was not what it is today. And the truth is that every day that we go blocking the development of transit-oriented, jobs-oriented housing in our city means additional acres of farmland get paved over somewhere in our state. And we add to the ranks of the super commuters coming 90 plus minutes from other parts of the mega region to come here for jobs. And so I think it's incredibly, it would be incredibly irresponsible of us to allow ourselves to go sideways for additional years with studies and reports and legal wrangling. I think we, we really um, need to get everybody to the table. And as I've suggested in my memo, map out a path to getting to a resolution quickly, even if that requires some kind of mediation or arbitration process. I, I did want to just, just to kind of clear the air on this question that's looming here, ask staff for just a, if you could, just a, an overview of are, from your perspective, the efforts we've made as a city to engage and collaborate and work toward a resolution? And I just would hope you could outline that a little bit. Thank you for the question, council member. Um, staff has had staff to staff conversations, uh, as mentioned in the presentation, with the uh, city of Santa Clara and the county of Santa Clara over many months um, on, on and my colleague said years. Um, <laughs> my, years. The, the subject matter has ranged uh, from the VMP discussion to the closure of the North San Jose plan to the plan for how to do that and traffic improvements and how they would get paid for. Um, and we, we have had those prior conversations and we do look forward to uh, building upon this uh, action today and talking to the county about how to proceed. Um, several of the uh, elements of the, the settlement agreement you just approved were in the existing agreement. So we are indeed trying to um, move forward uh, with successful mitigations that can help the situation even though we're under a, a VMP change of law. Right, great. Well, I just, Nancy, thank you and thank you to everyone on staff for how hard you've worked to try to find those mitigations and that, that practical path forward that gets us to where we wanna be here, which is 
attracting investment where it belongs, particularly in a, in a more mixed use, denser fashion near, near transit. Um, so thank you for that. And um, I am glad to hear that uh, Mayor Licardo and, and Councilor Cohen feel that they have great optimism that we're gonna get there. And I, I appreciate all the work that you and your teams have done along with Councilmember Perales to get us to this point and hope that we very quickly will have at least a plan to get to a resolution with our colleagues at the county. So thank you again for your efforts. And uh, that's all for me, Mayor. Thank you. There are comments. Uh, sorry to keep harping on this affordable housing issue in the historic, because I'm just trying to remember, I know several folks have said we built no affordable housing, but I can remember back in the days when I sat in Councilman Peralta's seat, we had three, 100% affordable projects move forward in Recon South. I remember Charities Housing in Rome, and I can't remember who was the other one. So we did have some affordable housing get built, right? That's right. The third one was first community housing. On oh, thank you. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Right there on First Street. Okay. Just want to make sure I'm remembering things right. So, so everyone, everyone tried their best. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? All right. Let's vote on this second part of the item. All right, now we are on to the report of the city manager, Jennifer. Yes, thank you, Mayor, I have no report today. Item 3.3 is a public hearing on the 22-23 proposed operating capital budgets and proposed fees and charges for the city of San Jose. Uh, no small thing, about $5 billion. Uh, we'll open it up for public hearing at this time. We have um, six in-person speaker cards, so we'll start with those first. I'll call your name. You can come up in, in any order. Um, Dinah Hayes, Kim, Kate, and Vanessa. Welcome, everyone. Please announce yourself when you get to the mic. Thank you. I'm sorry, the mic's not on yet. Let's see. Sure. There you go. Okay. My name is Dinah, and I wanted to let you know that I appreciate that the city is looking at how they can better support animal services in the proposed budget, but I am concerned that what proposed is insufficient to meet the needs of the community and the animals. The proposed budget and supporting memo number five do not address the current reality that animals are not receiving proper care today due to insufficient staffing, including vet techs, veterinarians, and the lack of availability of low cost or free spay and neuter. They, the staff are doing what they can with very little. The current job market is so competitive at this point across the board, particularly for vets and vet techs. I am very concerned that even adding staff and having open positions is not going to be sufficient. Vet techs and vets and shelter medical directors are being offered signing bonuses, additional vacation, subsidized housing, highly competitive rates, and are able to dictate their schedules and how they will work. Is the city going to be able to pay signing bonuses and relocation? Is there enough flexibility built into the city's processes and job description to be able to attract and retain employees. I would also look that the city look at contingency planning if these positions are not able to be filled or take a long time to fill. The shelter is not currently able to provide the services they are obligated to provide for the cities they are contracted with, such as Milper Milpitas, Cupertino, etc. And utilizing emergency medical services through MedVet at a higher cost is essentially the result. Is the city able to look at options such as overstaffing the animal care attendant positions so they are consistently recruiting rather than waiting for an opening, such as police and fire departments? And can we look for opportunities to fill the gap in services such as collaboration on mobile spay and neuter 
and vaccination clinics to help underserved areas, or ways to utilize surgical facilities if there is a vet staff with I'm sorry, the time's expired. Thank you very much. McIntyre, I'm a resident of Northside in District 3, and I'm a director of St. Francis. Okay, great. Uh, I'm the director of St. Francis Animal Protection Society. As a representative of a nonprofit animal rescue and partner to San Jose Animal Care and Services, I'm here to request financial support to address the secondary crisis to homelessness at the Guadalupe River Gardens. That crisis is animal overpopulation and suffering due to unaltered and unvaccinated pets. Since 2020, St. Francis has worked to address these issues by providing veterinary services and support spending nearly $130,000 in vet care over the course of the past two years. With the global shortage of veterinarians and a decrease in low-cost spay-neuter programs, the number of Guadalupe River Gardens pets who need our help far exceed the resources available to help them. We believe this work is critical in the broader effort to support our unhoused neighbors. With a grant from the city, we will continue this work and continue to improve the quality of life for the pets and their people living along Guadalupe River Gardens. Thank you. Thank you. Allie and Ann, if you guys can come down as well. Feel free to come forward. We'll take in whatever order folks would like to approach. You hear me okay? Yeah. My name is Kate Anber. I started volunteering, fostering, and overnighting cats and kittens in May of last year for the San Jose Animal Care Center. I was impressed and proud of the work that was happening at the shelter. Fast forward one year, and due to a change of management and subsequent loss of experienced vets and staff, I no longer feel that the shelter is a safe place for vulnerable animals. The immense weight put onto the line level staff is unacceptable, and I'm angry and upset that they are not supported to do the work that they are asked to do. These are young women in there working every day to save the lives of vulnerable kittens. The trash is not being taken out. The kennels are dirty. There's dirty laundry. Management is not in a position to support them, and I'm extremely upset. I am out in the field in many of your districts trying to help our community members who are overrun with cats and kittens. I am practicing TNR, and we are paying out of our own pockets to get these animals fixed because the TNR program at San Jose is on hold. If you can only take in one cat out of a colony of 20 cats, how am I ever going to get that colony under control? I can't. I'm dedicating my own time and energy and resources to be out there to help the community members, and I'm not getting a partnership going the other way. I understand that the budget is being, and I am grateful that the district, or that the council members and the budget is being increased to help, but as of right now, we have a crisis and we have volunteers, people who want to come in and help, and we cannot get management to even meet with us so that we can train additional volunteers. We can help today by providing more overnight staff for kittens or overnight volunteers, but it's like the current leadership can't even get out of their own way to take our help. So please help. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Hi, my name is Vanessa, and I'm here to explain why including a trap neuter return program in the budget is a necessary part in ending the crisis at the San Jose shelter. The shelter is in a state of emergency due to lack of staffing and funding, resulting in leaving unfixed cats and kittens on the street and an unacceptable quality of care for shelter animals. TNR is the only effective and humane way of controlling feral cat populations. High intensity TNR is the only solution to end high kitten intake numbers at the shelter. Every dollar put into a TNR program is money saved and reduction on future shelter intake. It is essential to include space for TNR in the budget because unfixed cats and lack of spay neuter are the source of the kittens. Without mass trapping and widely available TNR appointments, the cats will continue to breed. We need enough funding to hold mass spay neuter days for community cats and additional daily TNR appointments. 
Unless we take drastic measures now, cats will continue to suffer and the overpopulation of cats is going to get significantly worse. As the community fills with cats, the shelter fills to capacity with kittens, leading to overworked staff and high employee turnover. The solution to our problems at the shelter starts with TNR, and I urge you to increase the budget further for TNR services at the shelter. Hi everybody, my name's Allie Hewitt. I live in District 2 and I'm also here to speak on animal services. Um, from 2019 to 2021, I fostered 205 kittens, the majority of which came to me when they were under one week old. I bottle fed them every three hours, monitored their health, and I sent them to their new homes when they were two to three months old. The number of kittens that came through my house in three years amounts to just 4% of the 5,000 kittens that the San Jose Animal Care Center takes in in just one year. 75% of kittens born outside die before they reach six months old. And still neonatal kittens are one of the most euthanized populations at animal shelters due to the level of care they require. In 2020, the shelter's kitten save rate was an outstanding 93%. Currently, they're experiencing an unprecedented staffing crisis. Not only have they had to severely cut down on community services, but they are also having to make decisions that cause irreparable damage to the mental health of their staff. A 2015 study by the American Journal of, Pre of uh, Preventative Medicine revealed that animal rescue workers have a suicide rate that is five times the national average, a rate they share only with police officers and firefighters. While my fellow volunteers and I focus on preventing the unnecessary suffering of kittens born outside, I ask that you support your own city employees by expanding hiring efforts and adding benefited positions at the shelter. The public needs a reliable place to go to if they find an animal that's sick, injured, or too young to survive on its own. In past years, SJEC has received national recognition for their work and it's the city's duty to help them uphold that reputation. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Ann Chasson and I'm the co-founder of The Dancing Cat. We are a nonprofit cat rescue with a cat adoption lounge located at 15th and Julian in downtown San Jose. We're a partner with the San Jose Animal Care Center and have been rescuing cats from the shelter for the past seven years. We're also a community resource. And because we have a brick and mortar presence, we are in a unique position to help our community members. Like many you have heard from already, we are on the front lines. What we have experienced firsthand are the repercussions of the severe reduction in shelter services. Perhaps the one with the most impact has been the cutback and closing of the spay neuter clinic that served cats in San Jose and other contracted cities. The result is a predictable explosion in the number of kittens being born outside and a resulting stress on the shelter system, on rescue organizations, and on individuals that care about cats in our community. From my perspective, the basic problem is that the shelter is unable to provide the services that are necessary for the well-being of the community. Is there not enough money? Or as Matt Kano asserted last week, is it an HR problem with hiring and retention of staff? We don't know why, we just see the consequences. Desperate calls for help from community members. We get over 500 calls, emails and in-person pleas for help every year from people looking for new homes or affordable services for their pets. It's overwhelming. We and other rescue organizations and individuals who care for community cats are stretched to the limits in terms of what we can do. I urge your support for the shelter. This is a critical community issue and requires high priority attention. I've looked into what other cities are doing. I have some ideas. Thank you. Uh, thanks to, oh, I'm sorry. We have uh, 13 hands up online. Oh, moment. online as well. Okay. I was going to speak to the animal services, but why don't we wait until we have all the comments from the public as well. 
Cole. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council members. Uh, again, I appreciate all that you are doing in this budget process as an old budgeteer. I know it's a lot of work. Um, I'm here again supporting our CERT program, which is the Community Emergency Response Team, having eyes and ears on the ground in every neighborhood, uh, preparing folks for the disaster that with uh, the Hayward Fault, not a matter of if, but when. So I'm, I'm asking for an additional 100,000 to be included to my appreciation for what I understand to be 200,000 being included uh, through the mayor, uh, the staff such as uh, McKenzie and Jim Shannon's team uh, working so diligently to, to support our neighborhoods. I really uh, have had a, a great working relationship with my own uh, team as you came out to the Cambrian Community Center, uh, Mayor, and, and appreciate all that you're doing and look forward to this additional money because we not only wanna train the people, we wanna have the equipment ready so they can continue to practice their skills so they are ready and, and have those eyes and ears av available. That also will support the additional uh, police that you're putting into foot uh, work uh, in the neighborhoods with that local knowledge. Uh, LA has 60,000 search for 4 million people uh, which is one for every 66 people. And we're looking to do that at only the three or 400 per. So again, thank you. Uh, it'll be a long-term process to build what we need. Thank you again. Mitra. Hello, good afternoon, mayor and council members. My name is Mitra. Um, I am a union hotel worker. I'm here today to support the um, Essential Workers Council, calling for uh, a budget that reflects San Jose's core values, supporting working families, uplifting their rights, and centering the voices of the hardest hit excluded workers and neighborhoods. I, I urge you to vote for a workers recovery budget that starts working toward real solutions for the public sector workforce. We are hopefully coming out of a two year pandemic as residents, many of the services and aids available to us via city government um, are more needed than ever, but the staffing of these programs is very limited. Many of us have still not been back to work and are struggling to make ends meet. Is it fair to expect us to choose between putting food on the table, paying rent, or taking care of our health? Surviving on unemployment forces us to do just that. I still haven't been recalled back to work yet. In fact, my position may be done with uh, completely. Fortunately, I've had my union to help me uh, find uh, temporary jobs here and there, but you can't make a life that way. There's no benefits. There's no guaranteed of continued work. Before the pandemic happened, these were not choices we had to make. We always had the government to lean on when necessary. Please ensure that these public assistance programs are fully staffed and ready to provide aid. And I thank you for your time. Alec? Hi, my name is Alec. I was an essential worker during the pandemic. I'm also here to support the Essential Workers Council and urge you to support a workers recovery budget that invests in wage theft prevention. If wage theft prevention, or sorry, wage theft is by far the largest source of theft in the United States, it amounts to more than $15 billion every year. Uh, but workers have little recourse to recover stolen wages, except to put in more of their own time and effort to file complaints and resolve the issue. Without more effort and ability on the part of local government to prevent and resolve wage theft violations, millions of dollars are going to continue to be siphoned from the most vulnerable communities. I urge you to support the Essential Workers Council on these issues for a stronger and more equitable San Jose. Thank you. Andreas? Good afternoon, uh, council members. Uh, my name is Andres Salomonov, and I represent the Brahms Edgeview Neighborhood Association. Our neighborhood is facing a crisis. Um, we have always struggled with a very large feral cat population, but ever since the pandemic, the number of feral cats has exploded exponentially. A little known fact is cats can get pregnant at just four months of age with an average litter of four kittens. You can easily do the math and see that this is reaching crisis levels. 
Unfortunately, the pandemic has caused shelters to scale back their operations, specifically their neutering programs. In fact, San Jose has been continuously cutting back shelter services. As of two weeks ago, the City of San Jose Animal Care Center is not accepting feral cats due to lack of veterinary staff. It's devastating as this will result in even more cats. I strongly urge this council to provide funding to the City of San Jose Animal Care Center so, they're, so that they're able to hire full-time vets soon and reinstate the neutering program. Thank you. Luke? Hello, my name is Luke Bratton. I'm a representative for the Drywall Lathers Union here in San Jose. I'm also a resident of San Jose. I'm here today to support the Essential Workers Council calling for a budget that reflects San Jose's core values, supporting working families, uplifting the rights and centering the voices of the hardest hit excluded workers and neighborhoods. I urge you to vote for the worker recovery budget that will invest in wage theft prevent, protect, uh, prevention and workers' rights outreach for workers in the private sector. Uh, wage theft is a widespread and heinous crime. When unscrupulous corporations steal from their workers, it affects not just the worker themselves, but their families and their community. Millions of dollars have been stolen from our San Jose families, with the hardest hit impacts falling on workers of color, immigrants, and working women. Wage theft also hurts responsible small businesses who are forced to compete with criminal companies. Please vote to fully support the city manager's funding to staff up wage theft enforcement. Thank you. Dominic. Yeah, hi, my name is Dominic Toriano and I'm a representative for the Sheet Metal Workers Local 104 and a San Jose resident. I'm here to today to support the Essentials Workers Council calling for a budget that embodies San Jose's values of supporting working families and focusing in on the voices of marginalized members of the community. A comprehensive recovery budget must address the growing issue of wage theft in San Jose. Currently, the California State of California Labor Commissioner's Office is plagued by vacancies. It's struggling to efficiently process 36,000 plus pending claims for unpaid wages Close to half of those cases have taken longer than a year to resolve, while nearly 4,000 have languished for three years or more. Wage theft is a form of organized crime widespread and damaging to a community. When unscrupulous employers steal from their workers, it affects not just the workers themselves, but their family and the community. Wage theft also damages responsible small businesses who are obligated to compete with corrupt competition. Please vote to support the city manager's funding to staff up wage theft enforcement in the Office of Equality Assurance and partner with the County Office of Labor Standards Enforcement and its network for workers' rights outreach so we can prevent wage theft before it happens. Please vote today to support the Essential Workers Council call to protect working people. Thank you. Layla. Hi, good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Lila Korea, and I'm a city worker as well as a resident in District 2. Last month, I've lost multiple co-workers to other cities and other uh, private companies due to wages. Um, my workload has not, <laughs> not stayed the same. It's doubled and tripled. And um, in, even though we hire, we have to train the new employees. And um, I enjoy serving the city. I enjoy giving... Uh, providing the council members, building whatever the council member wants, um, but it's burning me out when there are vacancies. This won't stop unless our wages are e as good as the neighboring cities. Um, please, I urge you to help us, help you, and I thank you for your time. Krista? Hello, my name is Krista Delatori, and I'm speaking today on behalf of the South Bay Labor Council. We represent over 100,000 working people in both Santa Clara and San Benito counties. 
I'm here today to support the Central Workers Council, calling for a budget that reflects San Jose's core values, supporting working families, uplifting their rights, and centering the voices of the hardest hit excluded workers and neighborhoods. I urge you to vote for a workers recovery budget that one, invests in wage theft prevention and workers' rights outreach for workers in the private sector to protect our most vulnerable residents from wage theft and two, starts working towards real solutions for the public sector workforce to address the decade long recruitment and retention crisis at City Hall so that all our neighborhoods can get the services they need to thrive. An inclusive recovery budget must address the huge and growing issue of wage theft in San Jose as well. We also urgently need a comprehensive equity centered recruitment and retention strategy to value and support our city workforce. Today, San Jose has the opportunity to start building back better by listening to workers and people and community members, not just big businesses, and moving towards a recovery that includes all of us. Please vote today to support the Central Workers Council call to protect and empower working people, honor city workers, and pursue equity, equity for all San Jose neighborhoods so we can uplift one another. Thank you for your time. Francis? Francis? Okay, moving on to Zach. Hello, my name is Zachary Gilmore. I am an organizer with UFCW Local 5. I'm here today to support the Essential Workers Council, calling for a budget that reflects San Jose's core values, supporting working families, uplifting their rights, and centering the voices of the hardest hit, excluded, work, excluded workers and neighborhoods. I urge you to vote for a workers recovery budget that one, invest in wage theft present, prevention and workers rights outreach for workers in the private sector to protect our most vulnerable residents from wage theft and two, starts working toward real solutions for the public sector workforce to address a decade long recruitment and retention crisis at City Hall so that all our neighborhoods can get the services they need to thrive. Thank you for your time. Jill. Thank you. This is Jill Borders. Um, I'm actually calling for the animal services issue as well. I'm going to speak, however, on a different side of things because I am not a cat expert. The people that have spoken before, though, on the TNR program and the lack of, of that being made available and the management problems, I echo all of those concerns as well. Uh, but I do want to speak about, in general, our our path forward. And I think it was a woman named Dinah who spoke about the, you know, that's great if you've got a budget for staff, but we, to try to find somebody that will go and to work there, in my opinion, is going to be very difficult. And I'll tell you why. I hate to criticize um, our own city shelter, but I need to at this point. If you go walk into the city of Santa Clara shelter, it's absolutely gorgeous. It makes you feel like you're having an experience where you're going to meet your future forever animal, your future forever pet. When you go to the Humane Society of Silicon Valley, you also have that similar experience and you have the very strong feeling that these animals are being well cared for and loved until you have that wonderful experience of adopting them. When you walk into the San Jose Animal Shelter, it looks like, and I like to say, it's an anachronism. I mean, it's it feels like a, a shelter from the past, from our past, from our childhood, like more of a pound feeling. And I apologize, this is nothing, uh, you know, against those people that work there and the volunteers. It's it's something where, in my personal opinion, if you're going to look at the issues with the shelter, one of them that you're going to have to look at is capital improvements, serious capital improvements, and look what shelters are doing today to successfully keep their animals safe and clean in beautiful spaces. So there's a huge disconnect that's happening. And it's not just with um, uh, the loss of all of these different, you know, staff members, it's with the actual physical building itself. Thank you. Louise. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor Council members. Louise Auerhahn with Working Partnerships. And today you all are taking your next big step towards shaping the city's budget. And for the first time since I can remember, and I've been working on this a while, as have many of you, we have a historic budget surplus. So now is the time for us to really reinvest in workers who are essential to caring for our children and families, to supporting our healthy neighborhoods, to building affordable housing, 
relates it to everything we need to do to maintaining an animal shelter, everything that we need to create a city for all. And I know that you all have been working hard on this and agree that our city deserves a full and fair recovery that lifts up all of us, no matter what job we do or what neighborhood we live in. But there are a few unscrupulous corporations here and across the country who have used the pandemic as cover to expand their business models that are based on wage theft, raising profits by stealing from the very workers who make their businesses run. And those same corporate interests have long waged a war on public workers that's decimated many of our local public services here and across California. And in San Jose, there's been over a decade of disinvestment in our city workforce that's left essential city workers feeling undervalued and undersupported. And that means that many of our San Jose neighborhoods, and especially those working class neighborhoods of people in color and immigrants, do not get the core services they need. Uh, so I urge you to support the Essential Workers Council's call for a workers' recovery budget that invests in wage theft prevention and outreach to protect our most vulnerable residents and starts working collaboratively towards real solutions for supporting our public sector workforce so that all our neighborhoods can get the service that they need to thrive. Thank you. Blair. Hi, thank you. Uh, thank you for the word to the previous speaker. I, I think that said a lot. Um, thanks for the whole budget process this year. I wish you could have had a little bit more public comment time available after each item. Maybe that's something we can work on in the coming years. A minute public comment could be helpful. Um, yeah, I was, um, I was impressed with the idea that uh, you know, you have to work on natural disaster preparedness things. You're doing funding things for that with yourselves, with Measure T things. It's with the hopes that in a few years time, you can possibly get more uh, federal funding dollars for that. You described that during the budget process. Um, you, you've created a whole new natural disaster preparedness program that just simply tries to involve itself in the ideas of racial equity, health and human services ideas, and just an awareness for the public that I think has been outstanding and, and a, a real example for the entire Bay Area. I hope, you know, my prognostications are wrong and, I, and I've clearly tried to state they can be uh, for what to expect in the next year. And if they are wrong, I'm glad they are. I hope you can make that clear, the differences, because I think enough's been said by others that it, it merits concern that I hope you can make that clear for the public. I think there is an interest uh, how that situation is unfolding. And so we can be clear about it because the more we're clear about it, uh, the better. And uh, the safer our community is and the healthier our community is. And with that, you know, all the budget items, if we can learn to talk about, you know, balanced budget issues and racial equity issues, uh, wage theft uh, and, and matters like that, all within budget issues, if we can learn to make those efforts together as a community process, a whole community process, we can really grow in the next decade. Thank you. Keith? Yes, hi, my name is Keith Silva. I'm a business rep with Local 104, and I'd like to speak on um, creating funding for uh, wage theft. You know, wage theft, it's a real thing in our community, especially in the construction community. Um, I've seen studies where within the residential construction industry, we're up to 54% of workers have experienced wage theft in one form or another. You know, this could be not getting paid for overtime to companies drying up. We just spent, you know, a good hour talking about the housing crisis in, in North San Jose. And, and if you don't think it's real, I, I urge you council members to go to one of the projects in your area and talk to some of the members on these residential job sites. It is a real thing and, and we would like to see it funded. Um, so I would urge you to, to please vote to fully support the city manager's funding to staff up wage theft enforcement in the Office of Equality Assurance and to partner with the, the County Office of Labor Standards Enforcement and its grassroots network of workers' rights outreach so we can prevent wage theft before it happens. Thank you. Araceli. 
Hi, good afternoon. My name is Araceli, and I'm a San Jose resident, as well as um, calling on behalf of SCIU USWW. I am also um, calling here in support to the Essential Workers Council, calling for a budget that reflects San Jose's core values, supporting working families, uplifting their rights, and centering the voices of the hardest hit excluded workers in the neighborhood. Please vote to fully support the city manager's funding to restore recruitment and retention staff in human resources and to commit to a more comprehensive strategy working with city unions and communities to expand the number and diversity of applicants improve hiring from underrepresented communities and improve retention and advancement advancement of city workers thank you jose jose Hello, hi, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Jose Luis Pavon and I represent SCIU USWW, uh, who represents uh, janitors, airport workers, and uh, security officers in the city of San Jose. Um, today, we are here uh, uh, supporting the Essential Workers Council and, you know, just adding to what everybody uh, has said around wage theft, you know, people are really struggling right now. A lot of our members from our union work two jobs and with the cost of living constantly rising, with the cost of gas constantly rising, it is an absolute insult to, to workers who make the city run every day to be stealing their wages. You know, our, our, you know the average working class person, if you go into Safeway and you shoplift a gallon of milk worth, you know, $6, you, you'll probably go to jail and you'll get a criminal record, but employers can get away with skimming off of hundreds or thousands of dollars um, from workers' hard-earned money. So um, we, you know, we, we suggest uh, to support um, the Essential Workers Council's uh, budget recommendation. Thank you so much. Don? Hi, my name is Don Piazza. For the past eight years, I have partnered with the San Jose Animal Care Center as an advocate for the animals and as a trusted rescue partner with the nonprofit rescue I founded because of the overwhelming need to help shelter animals. The shelter has a history of being underfunded and understaffed, but recently there has been a mass exodus of employees, including both full-time vets seven vet techs, two shelter supervisors, and numerous animal care attendants who care for the animals daily. So as you can imagine, the shelter is severely handicapped at this point. And although the public and the rescue partners are frustrated dealing with the shelter in this state, it is the animals who suffer the most. I wanna share a quick story about Malachi. Malachi, like most dogs, when they arrive at this shelter, scared, are scared and aloof and starting to shut down. Because of this, Malachi was believed to be unsafe to interact with dogs or humans, and the shelter supervisor recommended Malachi be euthanized. But our organization rallied for more time. We understood what Malachi was feeling coming into the shelter, and we found Malachi a spot with a rescue group and arranged transport. However, transport, I had to postpone three times because Malachi sat waiting to be neutered for 10 days. There was no vet, there was no technician to neuter him. This is an example of not having adequate staff to get the dogs out of their kennel regularly, not having time to properly train staff on dog handling behavior and not having a vet to neuter animals in need. Joseph? Hi, how you doing today? My name is Joseph Lopez. I'm with the Carpenters Union. Um, I'm a San Jose resident. I've, a lot of people already touched on the uh, wage theft and I just kind of wanted to just voice my opinion on it. Um, you know, we walk these jobs and we talk to a bunch of people who are, you know, not in the union or work for, you know, in the private sector. And the stories that we hear 
you know, these people talk about how they don't get paid, how um, it affects their family directly from their kids to their wives, um, husbands, you know, it's, it's sad. And, you know, they're looking for a way, a better way of life. They come to the Bay Area looking for that better way of life, only to find out that it's expensive as heck to live here. Uh, they're living in, you know, um, horrendous situations, one bedroom, 10 people. I mean, it's, and they're still going to work and they're still being exploited. And what, we, what we're asking for is that city council really just focuses on this workers uh, recovery budget and that they, they put something together where... Um, people could be held accountable, uh, companies could be held accountable, um, and that there's just better standards for if you're going to come work in Silicon Valley, that there's a standard that we are pushing for all workers in private and in public sector. So that way, people will be excited to come to work and give their all and not uh, feel like, hey, you know what, today's my last day or whatever. There has to be some some security. And so I ask that you, um, that you just really take this um, to heart when you guys are working out this budget for the city of San Jose. Thank you. Francis. Um, Francis's microphone just disappeared. So I don't think they're able to speak. So back to the council. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank many members of the community who came to speak. I know we're going to continue to have these public hearings. Uh, going forward until our final decision comes in June. Uh, we've already had a couple of uh, community meetings out uh, in, in community centers, actually one community center so far, Council Member Police District. Uh, two more are coming up, and I want to encourage folks uh, to join us if they'd like to talk in greater detail about uh, the budget and its implications this Saturday, uh, May 21st at the Tully Branch Library at 10 a.m. from 10 to 2, 12. Uh, that's, in, I think, in Council Member Sparza's district. And then uh, next Monday, the 23rd of May, from 6 to 8 p.m. at Mexican Heritage Plaza. We'll also be streaming that through Facebook. Uh, and folks can participate on Zoom as well. So I want to encourage folks uh, to uh, learn more. You can go to sjmayor.org forward slash budget uh, to be able to get Zoom information to get on those uh, hearings or uh, those meetings rather than to be able to participate. We also have online a budget balancing act that people can participate in, which is a helpful way for you to convey how you would balance the budget and it provides us direct data from the community. Uh, I know several uh, members of the community came out to speak about animal services and we heard uh, many concerned folks come out uh, just a few days ago, Council Member Foley's uh, gathering let me just explain what at least is in the works now. Obviously, more to come as we discuss these issues in the weeks to come. But staff has proposed an increase in the budget and proposed budget for animal services of $669,000. I think it's a recognition of severe uh, staff uh, situation there that we need to resolve right away. Uh, Council, many weeks ago, approved an increase in veterinarian pay of 25%, which I think is more than we have for any classification anywhere in the city to address the issue there. I know uh, there's active recruitment ha happening there and we're, we're aggressively getting out there. We also know though that there is a, as with too many positions, unfortunately, today a real shortage of qualified staff throughout the region, uh, whether it's vet, veterinarians or vet tech or other um, services. So uh, we are challenged and obviously competing with many other cities trying to get uh, uh, people who uh, have those skills and talents to be able to offer. Uh, and the retention for vet tech and health tech positions is also being actively discussed by the council. Um, and uh, there will be conversations forthcoming with union leadership in the days ahead on that issue. So I, I expect there will be forward progress there as well. So appreciate there are many concerns uh, about resources, uh, particularly most important resources, which is people uh, who are doing the work. And uh, I think we're aggressively responding City manager wants to say anything. Uh, nope. Okay, we will. Or assistant city manager, forgive me. Uh, I will. Uh, we will uh, hear more, obviously, about the budget until the final vote in June, and we encourage the community to continue to stay engaged. All right, let's move forward now to uh, item six point one, which are actions related to long duration storage and wholesale energy services. Uh, Lori is here. Welcome, Lori.
Good afternoon, Mayor and <clears throat> Council. I'm Lori Mitchell, and I am the Director of Community Energy. And I'm very pleased today to be joined by Jean Soleil. She is our Deputy Director of Power Resources. Next slide. Here we go. I'm sorry. <laughs> so we get used to this. So we're very excited to recommend another investment in a long duration storage project. This project is called the Goal Line Project. So first of all, what is a long duration storage project? Well, technologies vary, but most commonly they are battery storage projects that store energy for use at a later time. Um, long duration storage is different than, than typical battery storage in that it discharges for at least eight hours or longer, which is really important as we look for technologies that can meet our evening energy needs. It also allows renewable energy to be used at a more advan advantageous time, which is in the evening. And of course, it's important to pair with renewables to ensure reliability while reducing our carbon emissions. Just as background, uh, we are required to make these investments in long duration storage. So back in 2021, the CPUC directed us to purchase 21.5 megawatts of long duration storage. Um, also back in 2021, we did join a new joint powers authority called California Community Power. It's comprised of 10 CCAs, and they released a solicitation for long duration storage to help meet these requirements. Um, they did receive 51 offers for long duration storage, and Goal Line was one of the five best offers shortlisted. And then you may remember on March 8th, Council did approve our procurement and investment in another long duration storage project that was called Tumbleweed. That was also one of the projects shortlisted through CC Power. So we still require about 10 megawatts of additional capacity to meet the, the CPUC requirements. So that's why we are recommending participating in this project. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jean Soleil to talk more about the project details. Yeah, good afternoon. Um, so this particular project is a 50 megawatt project um, San Jose's share will be 12.11 megawatts. Again, it is an eight hour lithium ion battery storage project. Um, we are asking for authority to buy up to 20 megawatts so that if one of our companion CCAs falls off, we can pick up some of their share. If we do that, the total annual amount will be $4.4 million for $66 million in aggregate. Uh, this project is located in San Diego. It has an online date of 2025, June 2025, and it has a term of 15 years. And then the other five CCAs that are participating with us, uh, three of them are investment grade rated, and the other two are taking a very small amount of the project. So we're very in very good company with this project. A little bit about the agreement structure. It's very similar to the prior project that we brought for you. There are four agreements. One of them will be between the CC Power and the developer where CC Power buys the storage services from the developer. There'll be a project participation share agreement, uh, which lays out which CCAs, what each CCA's share is. Um, and it also lays out how decisions are going to be made. Decisions are going to be made by the CC Power Board, um, but only by those CCAs participating in the project. There's a buyer liability pass-through agreement, which allows the developer direct recourse to a CCA, but only for that CCA's share of the project. And that's required because CC Power doesn't have assets or revenues although it will maintain some insurance to protect the CCAs. And finally, there'll be a coordinated operation agreement where we'll just lay out how the project will be operated by CC Power. 
We have explored some local opportunities. We heard you last time we were here. Um, we're always looking at opportunities to buy more locally. Just recently, we issued a solicitation and are very happy to shortlist a local project. Whether or not we can complete an agreement with that project, of course, will depend on negotiations, including some um, you know, questions about being able to get the appropriate land. And in addition, we've been in conversations with a small local project. Um, and if those conversations um, seem promising, we may issue a solicitation for small local projects in the fall because um, those types of projects could also provide some local resiliency benefits. Excuse me, Laurie Mitchell, Director of Community Energy. The second part of our recommendation today is a wholesale energy services agreement with the Northern California Power Authority. Just as background, back in February of 22, we did release an RFP for wholesale energy services, including scheduling agent services, um, with a pretty broad scope. And we did this because we have had these services under contract since our launch back in 2018, but these services that are currently provided by NCPA will expire in August. So the scope of these services includes um, you know, general services for scheduling, which includes a 24-hour staff desk and contract management system, load scheduling, forecasting, settlement, short-term forecasting services, generating resource scheduling, congestion of revenue rights management, and generator control services. In addition to those services, we also asked for a, a number of wholesale energy services, including portfolio management, risk management, resource adequacy compliance services, um, the California Air Resources Board compliance services, and long-term load forecasting services. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jean Soleil again to go through the RFO results and our recommendation. Yeah, so we issued the solicitation. We had four good proposals. Um, we did an interim round of scoring, um, which resulted in oral interviews with the three best bidders. And then we asked the two best remaining bidders to submit best and final offers, and NCPA had the highest overall score. Um, NCPA's qualifications, it has over 50 years of experience in the industry. It has a very strong focus in California independent system operator markets, including the types of services that we're looking for. It provides similar services to other significant CCAs in California, including East Bay Community Energy, Sonoma Clean Power, and to numerous municipal utilities uh, in Northern California. We um, The scoring gave them the best score because they had the best value given that they offered a comprehensive package of services uh, offered by very experienced staff. Um, and they, they even have redundant 24-hour uh, uh, control centers. So it exceeds the ISO's requirement um, in an emergency condition. The agreement structure would be three years with three possible extensions of two years each, subject to the mutual agreement of the parties. Uh, the annual cost would be $733,466 in year one. That would be escalated by 3% every subsequent year, and the maximum not to exceed would be $7.5 million. And that concludes our presentation. We're happy to take any questions. Thank you. Let's go to the public. Blair Beekman. I'm going to announce since we're trying to get to a six o'clock hearing, I think, and get everything done in time, we're going to go to one minute for public comment on the remaining items so we can begin those. We have a hearing at six. Is that right? Am I, am I mistaken? Oh, that's off. Oh, okay. I take that back. All right. We'll go. With, we'll stay with two minutes. 
Great, thank you. Blair Beekman here. I had a lot to say for this item, thank you. Um, I guess first off, uh, I thought the Measure T item would at least be spoken about today. I didn't know you'd taken it fully out. Uh, sorry about that. Um, I guess just a thank you for this item. Always uh, good to hear this sort of item. Uh, the future of long duration storage is an issue that, um, you know, our, it's our renewable future and that's, that's our good stuff. And as we're thinking about that and all the minerals that are going to be used for storage and, and, and our digital future, really always be considering, it has to be, as, as we think of these good practices, we have to be thinking about the worker rights inv issues involved for the storage uh, and the mining and, uh, of the minerals for the storage. For ourselves, we always have to be very aware of, of the importance of worker rights that uh, for the people who are going to be mining the minerals. So we have these storage issues uh, uh, safe for our future. Um, with that said, um, yeah, that's an important goal for myself in the future and how to think of this issue. And with that said, you know, just uh, boy, a good luck how we're going to talk about the future of renewable energy ideas in this modern age. Uh, in this age of, of warfare. Um, you know, we've tried really hard to uh, select, you know, when exactly will we use with, uh, when we will use fossil fuels and fracked fuels that will be a part of the renewable package I'm learning and understanding better. Um, we have to be real selective about that and really take note of that and, and, and how we move forward. So good luck in those efforts. It's a very cautious tale, but it's a responsible tale that I think we can do well. And we, we made those early good attempts that as I think we've all noticed in the past few years. Good luck in those continuing good efforts. Thank you. Louise? Uh, thank you. Uh, Mayor Council, Louise Auerhan with Working Partnerships. And it is, first of all, great to see San Jose Clean Energy really sort of growing up and moving forward and being able to solidify its position. I wanted to comment in particular on CC Power, which is the joint power authority that uh, you are all are using for some of your procurement, and ask in the future to look at providing direction to CC Power to adopt labor and environmental standards. This is an issue there is actually a coalition of labor, community, environmental, and EJ groups who has been working on this since last year. And CC Power has told them that they feel they don't actually have the authority to adopt a policy around their procurements, including labor and work and environmental standards, unless each of the member CCAs gives direction to CC Power to do that. Uh, that certainly seems something that is very in line with the goals of San Jose Green Energy and of this council. Uh, so I would urge you to look at moving forward with a resolution that would ask CC Power to adopt a policy for all of its procurements, including workforce standards and environmental and environmental justice standards. And this is important, especially since a lot of its procurements by the nature of the market will need to be out of town or out of state. Now that, that's how the market is working, but we want to make sure that if we are getting power from other places, we're not doing that in a way that undercuts labor standards or environmental standards, no matter where the power is being sourced from. Thank you. Back to the council. All right, thank you. Uh, back to the council. Any questions on either the two items contemplated here, long duration storage and wholesale energy services. I just had one quick question, and thank you for explaining this so clearly. Um, but uh, we know this, uh, the batteries physically in San Diego, as I understand it, um, where the electrons are stored is probably less relevant because this is sort of a system wide, I'm guessing the, uh, the sort of the ISO kind of determines ultimately who gets what, uh, is, that, is that fair to say? Yeah, no, it's a really good question. So, um, you know, the way electricity works a little bit different than water that flows through a pipeline to a location. Electricity just flows the path of least resistance. So electrons just go to whatever load serving entity is there. Um, 
the, so that's how the electrical system works. That being said, each uh, you know CCA and utility do, does have obligations to have enough capacity on the system to meet their load, right. and so that's why we're recommending this project. Right, and, and certainly I, I fully appreciate the importance of investing in long duration storage. Uh, and I, I can't help but think that you know maybe ten years from now they're going to be laughing at us because we think long duration storage is more than eight hours when we all know we need a lot more. But 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 I think it's great that you know we got to keep buying this stuff and. Um, my, my concern is, is the time when we'll need it the most, I'm guessing, is um, in the peak hours when the grid's under the most stress. And I'm, I'm, I'm guessing it may be uh, the, type, the time when we have the least likelihood of getting access to that same energy. And I'm wondering what happens under the contract when we've contracted and paid $4.4 .4 million a year for all this storage and uh, and in the middle of the heat wave, our residents are still left without access. Yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, and and so, you know, unfortunately, the or fortunately, the way that the electrical system works and is operated by the California ISO is um, they are responsible for ensuring reliability. We are of course responsible for making sure we have enough capacity on the grid. But I think what you're referring to is the heat wave in 2020 where the California ISO um, did initiate rolling blackouts. And how that works is they work with a local distribution utility provider to initiate those. Fortunately, San Jose was not included in that. You know, the other type of um, power shutoff that have impacted us is the public safety power shutoff program. And that again is, um, you know, really an issue with the distribution system not being able typically to be operated because there's winds and they are concerned about a fire being ignited, so they shut off that distribution utility. And in, in that case, you know, San Jose certainly has been impacted, even if those batteries were located here, unfortunately our, our, our residents would still be susceptible to those shutoffs because it still connects to that transmission and distribution system. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of effort going into that, and certainly um, we're supportive of, of making it more reliable. In the case of the former, the rolling blackouts, you know, this project will help mitigate the risk of that because it will be generating, and the California ISO will rely on it to meet those statewide reliability needs. So it is helping in that case. Yeah. Um, and a lot of progress has been made there in just bringing these new resources online. I'm just wondering, I, I, you know, I promise I'll stop after this, but particularly Diablo Canyon going offline and all that, I'm really concerned about long-term reliability of the grid, or at least medium term. And uh, at some point, does somebody compensate our ratepayers <laughs> for the, what we're spending on essentially storage services that they never may never benefit from? Um, ISO or anyone? Yeah, so so ratepayers, you know, you know, bear the the cost of the electrical system. I, I guess where I'm a little bit confused with the question, they are benefiting for it. So this particular project, they would benefit in the event of you know meeting the load in that evening peak. But maybe I'm not understanding. I guess if if I'm sorry, in the circumstances where the grid breaks down and and we're not able to actually use the stored energy in a way that which we we've all paid for. Right. Right. Does ISO then say, okay, we'll cover the 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 impact of the ratepayers or is just tough luck? Yeah, unfortunately they don't. So in the event of a public safety power shutoff, ratepayers are not compensated for um, the loss of the power or any other business use associated with that outage. Okay. Um, so all this really depends on a grid that we don't control. Unfortunately, yes. Yep. Here we go. <laughs> Any uh, questions, comments? All right, let's, uh, let's, is there a motion? There's not a motion. So move to approve. Motion now from somebody. I'll, I'll second. Okay, let's vote. Perales? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Davis? Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mayhan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Thank you.
Great. Thanks, everybody. Uh, I managed to skip a very important item, which is 3.5, which is that portion of the Measure T. Thanks, everybody. Um, that was a portion of the Measure T update relating to the $250,000 allocation. Is it, is it subsection D1 and 2? Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So I think we agreed under uh, orders of the day that we would consider that item. Uh, and that has to do with the police gun range. So is there a motion on that item? I'll move to approve. Second. All right. Motion from Councilmember Peral, second from Councilmember Foley. Is there any comment from the public? One hand up. Blair Beekman. All right, Blair Beekman. I was hoping to speak on the on the whole item, like how it was just supposed to be a, a time of a overview of, of the Measure T program, I felt. May I have time to speak on that? Yes, this is the time to speak on that item. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, Measure T items were mentioned during the budget time, and I mentioned uh, also that uh, you know, the Measure T body was trying to develop ways last year at this time to develop better community outreach because they wanted to develop, a, a, you know, what their programs will be entailing for the next few years. They worked hard on issues of, uh, uh, you know, bridge uh, overpass retrofitting, uh, earthquake retrofitting and programs like that. And they wanted to start to create more community outreach and what that exactly would it mean and it entail. It was mentioned at the budget meetings that uh, if we were to do that in this past year, that uh, there were programs that that are coming up now that 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 needs that sort of uh, uh, exposure. It needs it needs outreach and it's not getting it because something was dismissed in the past year it was it, it didn't go through um you know my work with accountability with technology and everything that it, it can help with it could have really helped the, this process along and what and help a process of better guidelines and oversight which is what you know part of the intentions of uh you know, uh, Measure T and, and open public policies were meant to work together in the future towards anyway. So you really missed a shot in the past year. I hope you can realize that now and, and want to build those ideas of community accessibility for the future of Measure T that's available now. And uh, good luck how we can talk about openness and clarity with issues of uh, natural disaster preparedness. Thank you. Back to the council. Okay, on this motion, customer process vote. Oh. Matt Kano, thank you for spending your afternoon with us. <laughs> All right, 6.2, a Republic Services commercial solid waste customer service rates. Um, it passed, I didn't get a vote from Jones. Okay. Vice Mayor, did you wanna vote verbally? So that motion, that motion passed. Okay, that passed. We got eight votes on that one. Okay, now we're on to 6.2 Republic Services Commercial Solid Waste Customer Service Rates. We have no presentation. Is there a motion? I'll move approval. Second. Comments, discussion, let's go to the public. Blair Beekman. Hi, Blair Beekman. Uh, just a quick comment that if uh, the use of subsidy and the talk of subsidy and uh, the openness and conversation we can have about subsidy is uh, applicable <laughs> to this item, I hope you can be able to uh, discuss this sort of item in terms of subsidy with the public well, and it can be an open, enjoyable, and clear subject for everyone. Thank you. Back to the council. All right, let's vote on the motion. That passes. Our final item of the afternoon is the proposed spending plan for Measure E Real Property Transfer Tax Revenue for the next fiscal year and amendments to the spending plan for Measure E Real Property Transfer Tax uh, for the last fiscal year, at last two fiscal years. And Rachel has patiently been waiting. Uh, this is, I guess, the third in our series of public hearings on Measure E as required under the measure. Rachel, take it away. All right. 
Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. My name is Rachel Vanderveen, Deputy Director of the Housing Department. I'm joined by Jackie morales Ferran virtually. She's joining us online. And um, as you just mentioned, over the past, past few months, we've had several conversations regarding Measure E and the policies that set priorities for spending these funds. Today's action is focused on implementation by adopting spending plans for our Measure E funds. The objectives of the action today is to approve amendments to the 2020 and 21 spending plans, amendments to the 21-22 spending plan, and approving the spending plan for our coming year, 22-23. Measure E was passed by the voters in March 2020. Since that time, the City Council took action to approve spending plans for these funds in June 2020 and 2021. Last month, the City Council passed amendments to Council Policy 1-18, changing the allocation of Measure E funds. The Housing and Community Development Commission, serving as the oversight committee for Measure E, approved the amended and proposed spending plans before you tonight. The City Council previously approved the spending plan for 2021, but since that time, additional funds were received in Measure E revenue that exceeded the amount in the plan. So now we're coming back to you to adopt an amendment that will allocate the additional funds that were received during that fiscal year. The new funds in this plan include an additional $9.7 million for new construction of extremely low income housing, an additional 7.5 million in acquisition rehab that will be used for low income or is in our low income household category, an additional 2.1 million that will be added to our ADU program, and an additional $2.1 million that will be going next year to Destination Home to be used for housing, um, for homeless prevention um, services. The spending plan for the current year, 2021-22, was passed. However, the budget was amended to increase the expected revenue by an additional $50 million. The amended spending plan for this year also takes into consideration the recent changes to the allocation policy of Measure E funds. So in this plan, what we are adding is an additional $5 million for new construction and land acquisition for the extremely low income category. We're adding $13 million for hotel acquisition, and this is specifically tied to our efforts related to the Home Key program, where we're securing state funds to um, acquire hotels. So this is our, the city contribution towards that effort. We also have an additional $13 million for new construction and for land acquisition and then um, 600,000 for new construction in our moderate income housing category, 3 million towards rental assistance and case management for targeted encampments, 2 million for additional funds for destination home to, to provide rental assistance, and then our new category, and we are allocating 13 million towards the operation and construction of interim housing. So looking forward to next year, we are anticipating receiving $65 million in Measure E funds. And so what we're doing tonight is to lay out our spending plan for how we're going to use these um, funds in the next year. We are, again, as you can see, we're using the new allocations that were recently approved by council, and, um, and we, we are breaking them down into different categories under those broad um, percentages. So in our extremely low income category, we are going to be funding new construction. We're also funding 
like I mentioned earlier, the acquisition and rehabilitation of hotels. And we're also looking at acquisition rehabilitation um, of existing housing. So that's another priority this year. For our low income household category, we are setting aside $10 million for land acquisition in areas of the city that are, have been defined as areas of opportunity. And this was something that we discussed and brought forward as a part of our conversation related to the siting policy. And we're also providing funding for $3 million in funding for a first time home buyer program that will focus on creating wealth for our historically disadvantaged groups um, who have really not benefited from home ownership in the past. All right, and our, in our last categories for homeless prevention and solutions, we have several different priorities for our homeless prevention efforts. Um, in this next year, we are providing funding to Destination Home for both a general program, but also a specific set aside for survivors of domestic violence. We also have funding for Bill Wilson Center to provide student housing for our homeless students. And then we are also setting aside funding for rental assistance and case management for our encampment residents. Then we also have a, um, this is our, again, our new category of providing funding, for operation and construction funding for our interim housing. Here we actually know there are specific um, service providers who will be receiving this funding to do our work directly. So we have Home First for the Arena Hotel, PATH for the Pacific Motor Inn, um, and then we have additional funds that we're setting aside um, generically that we can allocate throughout the year for our maintenance and operations and then um, just our broader operation and construction of interim housing. And then of course we have 15% which is set aside for the administration of the Measure E funds. So this is a lot of information and what I wanted to do was really highlight where is this investment going? How can you kind of think about it all at once? Over these three plans, we are talking about an, um, two, over $200 million in Metro E funds. This is a significant investment and, and, a, and a significant relatively new funding source for the city. And so what we wanted to do was just look across the three plans. So you can kind of get an idea um, of how we're investing this money we'll be dedicating $89 million towards new construction, $25 million for acquisition rehab, which is a real commitment to an area that we really, honestly, over the last several years have not had a chance or an opportunity to um, work in. We also have $22 million for the interim housing construction and operations. We have $21 million for hotel acquisitions. And we have $20 million for homeless prevention which really breaks down into a lot of support for different um, specific groups, including domestic violence survivors, um, home, our homeless students, and also um, funding for our encampment support. So with that, that concludes my presentation and um, we're available for any questions that you might have uh, related to our Measure E spending plan. Thank you, Rachel. All right, let's go to the public. Catalyze SB. Hello, this is Alex Shore again with Catalyze SV. Rachel, thank you for the report and for allowing me to share these thoughts again with you and the city. Catalyze SV members continue to evaluate and review development projects every month including many wonderful affordable housing projects in our community. And frankly put, they're getting fed up seeing development projects that don't build as much density as they could and in the face of this housing crisis. And 
knowing that there's a floor here or a floor there, knowing that there's more parking maybe than there needs to be near transit is just getting them really upset. And they want to see developers as well as city support as much affordable housing as possible. So we really want to see when our governments like the County of Santa Clara and the city of San Jose have these wonderful, extremely important measures like E and A, we want to see you leveraging your investment to get as much affordable housing as possible so that the developer is truly creating the most benefit for our community when we have such a need. So we want to continue to have that conversation with you at the city, and we urge you as you release NOFAs, as you decide which developments to fund, to really just simply, very simply, ask the developer, are you building as many homes as you can? And that even takes into account construction materials. We're seeing projects using things like mass timber, which can increase the amount of density beyond the oftentimes seven story projects that we see. But we shouldn't be having four story or three story affordable housing projects when we can at very least have seven according to construction materials in the general plan. Thanks so much for considering this perspective. Sandy. Hi, I'm uh, Sandy Perry, and I guess I'm, I'm the president of the Affordable Housing Network. I'm also on the board of the South Bay Community Land Trust. Um, I'm speaking today in support of this uh, spending plan and particularly in support of the 25 million, which is uh, being allocated for acquisition and rehab of existing market rate apartments. Um, this is part of the city's uh, anti-displacement plan, which the council already uh, adopted. And it's, uh, it's really uh, an essential part of, of stabilizing our neighborhoods, of racial equity, cultural preservation, and tenant empowerment. Um, it's, uh, it's even more important than the number of units it's going to keep the people who are currently in neighborhoods, keep them there and not uh, have them displaced. Uh, and when you are able to keep people there and stabilize neighborhoods, that spreads out from just housing to schools. It makes the schools better. I was even at the barber shop today. The barber said he's discouraged because he can't keep his kids' little league teams together because people keep leaving the area. Uh, this is a, a major crisis, and I just want to point out the, that uh, the, uh, the preservation part of this plan is uh, going to be, is, has an impact above and beyond the number of units. And the number of units is significant anyway, because it's uh, more economical than new construction. And so units that are saved through preservation uh, can be both economical and are important for the neighborhood. Thank you very much. Blair. Hi, Blair Beekman here. Uh, thanks for the word to the previous speakers. Um, I guess, you know, with the uh, people from City of Santa Clara here earlier, um, I, I, I hope I can really impress upon the importance of what I'm understanding is, uh, is what can be mixed income ideas to yourselves and what that can do for what these sort of questions are asking about. Um, it's more than mixed use ideas, it's mixed income ideas that I think, uh, you know, all the other major California cities have been doing studies on, on mixed income ideas right now. And, and the San Francisco Bay Area was excluded from that process. I don't know why that was. I don't know if it was the assumption that we're supposed to be a bit smarter and more intelligent than other cities. So we could just, you know, go right into its work. And you and the city of Santa Clara have already done some really interesting work with mixed income ideas. So, um, but yet it's not really quite fully taking here in the Bay Area yet. I think we really should be doing some important study session work on mixed income and, and just an awesome flexibility and choices it offers. It really answers the density questions that was being asked about previous by Alex Shore. Um, to put to house people of, of higher income and lower income in the same building, in the same neighborhoods, and to figure out those patterns 
I think just offers an array of good choices for ourselves that we're too afraid to still talk about here in the Bay Area. When are we going to start having those open conversations? Um, do we have to wait until 2028? I think that's a little absurd. We should start having those conversations now. Uh, I've been talking about it a lot. I know you guys already know this stuff and can, can feel comfortable with it. Learn how to you know, plan and talk about these things about mixed income more openly. Thank you. Jill? Hi, thank you. Jill Borders here. Uh, I wanted to echo what Sandy said a couple of speakers er earlier. I am really for the land acquisition piece of this, and I'm really grateful for it. I think that actually the key to the future of really solving any kind of crisis when you're talking about housing crisis is really to, to focus in on the idea that we're really having, in addition to that, a stability crisis. And he hit the nail on the head. Stability is going to be the key to a healthy community, a healthy city. And so, for example, I'm going to give you my own personal example. I moved six times while my daughter was very, very small. And when we were finally displaced when she was nine, I said, I just can't take this anymore. We have to either leave or we have to buy something. The only thing we could buy is a mobile home. And I'm proud to say that ended up being the perfect solution for us. Um, it has opened my eyes to a lot of issues that relate around land and housing and rentals versus, um, versus, versus ownership. And so that land acquisition piece is going to be fabulous, but I'd like to see if any there's any way that through major e-funds that we can pair that with an ownership piece. Um, without that ownership piece, without that that part of it where we say to people, you are um, going to be able to stay here because you own it. And when are we going to start talking about the idea that we do not have to have land ownership and building ownership, those two combined be the only answer. So in the example of the mobile home situation, sure, we're having all of this issue over the landowner versus the home owner, but I've had almost nine solid years here to finish raising my daughter. And that has been an essential ingredient to the stability that our family needed for a healthy situation. So please, ownership is key. Oscar? Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. My name is Oscar Castro, Working Partnerships. Um, we'd like to first um, thank everyone involved with this matter, as there's been multiple discussions throughout this year on Measure E, which is uh, an extremely important um, piece at addressing our housing crisis with flexible dollars to address various solutions. Um, working Partnerships, along with other partners, have worked hard throughout this year to ensure that Measure E is in fact addressing um, many various solutions. And uh, we'd like to also express our appreciation for um, council approving that homeless prevention funds would stay exclusively as such. Um, there's a real importance for having um, these funds set aside for homeless prevention rental assistance, especially as many statewide protections have expired uh, that were related to the pandemic. Um, in addition, we'd like to um, echo some sentiments from some partners um, about expressing our excitement for um, funding dedicated towards acquisition and rehabilitation. Um, there's a real importance of funding preservation efforts uh, in order for these efforts to really flourish. It's important to make sure they have necessary resources to go through with various projects. Um, preservation is an important um, piece in addressing displacement in San Jose and has been identified as such within the city's anti-displacement um, program. So we'd like to, again, um, express our thanks for um, having this being part of staff's thinking going forward. Thank you very much. Andrea. Hi, my name is um, Andrea Portillo and I'm the Community Organizing and Policy Manager with Somos Made Fair. I also just want to echo uh, what a lot of other partners have already shared, um, but really want to express my support for the Housing Department's proposed Measure E spending plan. Specifically, I want to highlight um, the $25 million allocation for acquisition and rehab. Again, I really think this highlights the city's commitment um, to its anti-displacement strategies. Um, preservation is a really key strategy that can help us address a lot of the displacement that we're seeing in our communities. This is a key strategy also in supporting um, the city's efforts in expanding its housing stock. 
um, and as a way, again, to ensure that our communities are healthy and sustainable and stable. Um, funding is really key um, to support a lot of the efforts that we've been working on with a lot of partners in the community. Really want to um, highlight a lot of the work that um, South Bay Community Land Trust um, is doing and striving to continue to do. And so funding is really key um, to support these projects, um, to support capacity building and TA support for a lot of the work that folks on the ground are excited to do, uh, especially around um, acquisition and rehab work. So really just uh, wanna express my support again for this specific item. Um, thank you. Back to the council. Thank you. Um, Rachel, as we've gone through this very extensive process, to be able to amend the plan. I wanna make sure we don't put you and all of us in a box. We then have to <laughs> get through a lot of more meetings to be able to get out of. Um, so I, as I just look at the plan, for example, I'm looking at the amended plan for 21-22. For example, $13 million is dedicated to acquisition of hotel. And I just wanna understand, because I know that tends to be pretty opportunistic, right? Whether or not there's a hotel owner ready to sell and uh, the, the right side, right timing, all those kinds of things, and maybe having home key money that could help support some operations or something. All those are factors we have to consider, and I'd hate to think you guys would get stuck because maybe the opportunities aren't there for hotels, so you can nimbly redeploy that money for some other ELI purpose. Right. So can you okay. help me understand, or are, yes. are you guys stuck with $13 million, uh, direction, or can you move that money around? Okay. Um, all right. Well, I hear your question because I, I think it probably applies broadly to the plan. As yeah, well. right. So, yeah, that's just um, an example. Okay. So um, I'm just trying to think about how to work through this. So when we were going through the whole process of, um, you know, just the recent process of trying to reallocate, we realized that in our spending plans, we did receive more money. And then that's why we're coming back to you with these amendments too, which is, it feels, I mean, you know, I feel like we could have done that earlier, but we just, we really kind of hadn't established a process. So I think what we would like to do is work with the budget and have the budget, like the budget process be our mechanism to make these changes, right? So, so in the um, annual process, we will say, here's our right. spending plan. But then as we, um, as we reconcile with, you know, processes like the annual report and that kind of thing, we can actually see, oh, we actually received more money than we expected. And then we, we just need to keep taking those opportunities to clean it up and make sure that it, the money is reallocated and we can move things around as we learn and, and determine that we need to make choices differently. Okay. So let me jump in. This yeah, Jackie. Is Jackie Ross Brown, the director of housing. So we did feel somewhat of an obligation to be more specific in order to demonstrate exactly where we were going to be spending money. And so we are going to need money for the current hotels that we're acquiring. Uh, so for example, the Arena, Arena Hotel. Um, there is a city portion that we're going to need to uh, contribute as well. So I think part of the, the and I'll, I'll go, I'll kick it back to Rachel, uh, on the motel budgets, are we planning on using any of it for the three, uh, the two sites that we have already submitted in our current applications? And are there future hotels you're looking at? So maybe let me jump ahead to my next question, because it's, I understand why you'd want to align this process with the budget process more generally. And that way, you know, everybody's paying attention to the same things anyway. That help makes sense. But I guess the question I'm getting at is, do you really want us saying that the, the spending plan is all those details? Wouldn't you rather just have us as a council say, the spending plan is the basic allocation, that is the 40%, the 30%, the 5%. And everything else is just an explanation of what staff intends to do so that you have some flexibility within those broad categories if you need to move nimbly and take advantage of an opportunistic situation where, oh, wait, we can go get a hotel. Let's go do it right now. Oh, wait, we're, we're capped out and we can't do that. 
I think part of the challenge, Mayor, is that, again, without having specifics, then our oversight committee can't review what we're planning on spending to ensure that everything we have suggested in the plan is, is um, eligible under each of these categories. And certainly we have a very broad opportunity uh, uh, in terms of what we spend the funding on, but it was really our intent to be able to show the public, here's where we plan on spending funding. And usually in the, in the previous year, we can see forecast what's coming up in front of us, but Measure E would not be our only source of funding if right. we needed to move uh, and take advantage of other opportunities. So we still have 20% funding, we have inclusionary, we have the commercial impact fee. And so those don't require this level of detail that we're just trying to provide the public so right. that they can be assured that <clears throat> You know that, that again we have opportunities and commitments to spend in particular areas of interest yeah i'm not i'm not suggesting for a moment you wouldn't show the transparency of exactly what you intend jackie as, as the housing director about where you'd like to spend within these within these subcategories i guess what i'm suggesting is is that we'd have essentially the categories would be approved by the council and all the details would be approved by the housing director. And yes, they'd all be brought forward in the same plan, but you only get council approval for the broad category. So that way you have the flexibility to be able to move dollars if you're in that, that critical moment. Um, I, I got it. I just want to make sure I understand what you're saying. So in this case, we would say under the 40% bucket, we're going to fund two different types of activities. We don't, we're not going to break out necessarily what line items and how. No, much. I'm saying go ahead and break it out. Uh, and that's that's up to the housing director to approve that breakout. And certainly the, 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 the council could debate, oh, we need more of this or less than this, but, and, and I guess the council could always weigh in if they wanted to, right? But, but fundamentally, I think you would want, if I were in your shoes, I'd say, hey, council, I want you to approve that, and I'm looking at table three right now as an example, which is the 21-22 plan. I want you to approve the 40% for ELI, 30%, for low-income households, um, the 10% for homeless prevention and rental assistance. I want you to approve all that stuff. The details, I'm going to show everybody right now as part of this plan, because this is what I, as the housing director, and I, you know, the city manager, are, are going to be directing these dollars for more specifically, so everybody understands what we're doing. But I only want council approval for this stuff, because otherwise, the, the, the nature of the procedural requirements we've imposed through the, through the measure uh, I'm just going to leave you a little bit hamstrung. Got it. I mean, if the council would give us that level of flexibility, we would be happy to have it. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I just jumped in at, on the third hearing. I know we've got a lot of folks who want to speak. So uh, let's look forward to hearing from my colleagues. Uh, Councilmember Foley. Thank you. Uh, I think the plan is a solid one and, and I will be supporting it. Not sure if it's going to get a motion and then modified as the mayor wants, but I'll let someone else make that motion. But I'm more concerned or, or I just want to raise a, a concern about the future dollars. I know the plan that w there's a couple of plans. One is spending what we've already received 21-22 but I'm very concerned about the economic impact of 22-23, the inflationary uh, situation that we're in and whether we're heading into a recession and ultimately how that's gonna affect property values and sales and transfer tax, since that's what where this pot is. So um, I don't know if you can help me with this or maybe I need to talk to Jim Shannon about it, but. Have you, are you watching going forward? The 22, the 22, 23 allocation is based on projections of income. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. And we're working directly with Jim Shannon and his team to develop projections for that. And they're watching it very closely. Okay. So, uh, and uh, I've been attending these realtor meetings on a regular basis just to get a, stay in touch with the pulse of what's happening in the real estate market. 
And in the residential real estate market, what they're seeing is a slowing down of the market. Property values, uh, people are um, reducing their price, their list prices and selling, which we haven't seen in a long time. There's not as much activity in open houses, so there aren't as many people buying. And that's triggered a lot by affordability right now. I, I know affordability of a $1.5 million house, but those are people who now uh, were using their stock to buy, uh, that's their down payment, and they may not have access to it because the stock prices have, have plummeted in the way they have in the last few months. Or interest rates, they were counting on interest rates being lower and interest rates continue to go up as the Federal Reserve raises the interest rates. So I'm really concerned on the future dollars, the 22-23 plan. I agree with the allocations, the percentages, I think that's important. And, and I, I acknowledge that the percentages don't tie us into a dollar amount and it will be based on what we actually receive. But I just want to sort of put it out there that there is going to be a softening in the real estate market, certainly in the residential real estate market. And we need to be aware that the 65 million, I think you said it was, may not be 65 million next year. It may be less than that. So I really like the percentages rather than the dollar amounts because that's tied into what you're actually receiving. So I, I appreciate that and I assume that Jim was watching it and the budget department is watching it because it's a, it's a key number that was more than we expected, but it could be less than budgeted next year based on the economy and where we may be, where, where we may be heading and all the uncertainty in the uh, geopolitical world. The other thing I wanted to just ask a question about is that when we passed this measure or, or we voted to put it on the ballot, we put a trigger in place where the minimum threshold of 2 million, which was the trigger, that that would go up as either property, va as um, inflation went up or other factors cost the char uh, cause the median price to go up. Are we tracking that? Okay, so let me just try and repeat what I heard your question. So. When when Measure E was passed, there are um, there's different values set for the real estate transaction, and then that you know if it's a one point five million dollar transaction, it will pay this percent of the transfer tax, and it has a scale, and um, that was set, and that it doesn't it's not set to change. Do you see what I'm saying? Like. Um, whatever the scale is, is the scale for the measure going forward. But well, wasn't the scale two million? I thought the the tr the trigger for transfer tax was a two million threshold. On, I guess, on all real estate, not just residential. Okay, oh, if you just give me one minute, I'll look it up. Sure, thank yeah. you. I appreciate that. Okay, and beyond that, I don't have any other. It is two million dollars. I just looked in our memo. Uh, it is yeah, two million. It, it yeah. is. It the is two million, and it does not have a uh, an annualized cost increase. Okay, thank you. That that's the end of my questions or comments. All right, thank you, uh, Councilmember Mahan. Thanks, Mayor. I'll be quick. Uh, thank you for the report, and I know we've discussed many times here recently. So I uh, just appreciate that we've pulled this uh, together and updated our measure spending plan and glad that we have more money than we anticipated. That's great news. I had a quick question and comment. Along the lines of where I think Councilmember Foley may have been going there, and apologies if I missed this, have we um, tried to estimate and, and um, project out what kinds of ongoing costs we, uh, we essentially commit to with each year's spending plan? Because we're very we're very capital heavy right now in what we're investing in, which may be true for many years, but um, over time as we make those capital investments, I, I assume we kind of implicitly uh, take on additional costs to operate, to maintain that capital. Um, so do we have, a, have you all done an analysis of with each year of spending, how much we're obligating ourselves to ongoing operations? Okay, yes, uh, council member, this is Rachel Vanderveen, and um, I would, 
I would address that in different categories because we are doing a, several different activities um, with this plan. So for example, with our new construction, the way that we work that program is we provide loans to developers and we provide that at the beginning, right? At the front end. Yep. So we put in $10 million, let's say they go ahead and develop and then it's their responsibility to operate and pay for the maintenance and operations of that of that new housing. And so when we put that when we make that investment at the beginning, we are not creating an ongoing obligation. Right. Now for something again like homeless prevention services, obviously we just pay for that and it's a one-time thing. We're providing help to a family in a time of need and they receive that money, but that doesn't create an obligation for for the new, you know, for that same family. Unless it requires new staff, the, the staffing to manage, I assume, additional staffing. Correct, but again, we have, a, we have a contract for a certain amount of funds, and so our providers have to just scale to, to assume that that's how much they have. I so, see, because it's always done through a third party. It's always, Got yes, it. yep. exactly. So it doesn't, it doesn't create a new, um, city employee or something right, right like that. Um, the one area where we have done extensive projections is trying to understand when we invest in an interim housing solution, how we're going to pay and operate that facility over time. Yep. And so we've worked really closely with, um, with housing, with public works and with the budget office to put together a model that we have brought forward to council to show what those obligations are. So that is an area where as we make the investment, it comes with an obligation to operate over time. Okay. And let me just jump in that uh, we are coming back in June uh, with the city manager's office around interim housing and the proposed budgets for those projects. Awesome, great, okay, very cool. Looking forward to that and then, um, the second point I had was just around thinking back to yesterday's conversation of setting and managing toward outcomes. I, I would be interested to see in, in the future when we look at a spending plan like this, if, if possible, the estimated impact tied to an OKR. I know we're still establishing that system, so we haven't really built it out yet, but I'll just share that I, I think it would be helpful within those categories to have a sense of, for a given amount of dollars, what do we estimate the impact to be and how does that contribute to the OKRs we've set in terms of number of people we're able to prevent from falling into homelessness, uh, people were able to transition from being unsheltered to being sheltered and along that continuum that we've, that we've built out. I saw that the example yesterday that Dolan shared was really compelling. It would be Neat over, and I think helpful to the council for making informed decisions over time to to see that connective tissue between a spending plan and the uh, the top level goals. So I just wanted to flag that because it seemed appropriate based on the example that we saw yesterday. And feel free to comment if you'd like, but I just want to throw that out there. Thank you, and that's all I had, Mayor. So I would say um, that we would typically provide those outcomes after we do the funding. Um, of projects and so like on all the homeless ones we will provide those measurements and we are aligning them we, we were the ones who came up with those outcome measurements that you saw yesterday and so we are aligning our work in order to ensure that we can track it and report on it yeah and i so definitely we, think it's important to measure the actual impact at the end i think in the spirit of yesterday's conversation i would also hope that we are setting goals and estimating the impact we think we can have for a given budget decision so i just sure. i hope that we both estimate on the front end and then because it's actually the delta between the two did we have more or less impact than expected that that actually generates the learning so that we make a better decision keep making better decisions each year thanks mayor that's all i had great lee yeah just uh moving a little too quickly and misspoke wanted to clarify that the $2 million threshold does have um, an adjustment automatically starting in uh, 2025, so uh, January 1, 2025. So it will be adjusted based off of CPI every five years um, starting on that date. 
And I just want to clarify, was that with CPI or was there another index? I was trying to remember when we did this back in. The full text says con consumer price index. So we would yes. probably be using the San Francisco, Oakland, San Jose. Okay. Okay. Yep. Great. Okay. Good to clarify that. All right. Uh, Councilman Renz. Thank you. Um, so I have a question around the ADU item. Um, sorry, I'm trying to bring that up on my screen. Um, it has an item, uh, it has a funding um, just for ADU. And I think I asked this the last time that, that we had this discussion about um, garage conversions. And for those um, folks who hadn't adhered to um, a permit or hadn't um, wanted to um, be in line with, with a, a permitted garage, uh, and if we were doing something about that, is there any plans for us to include garage conversions as ADUs are, are typically, um, I would say beyond middle class, I would say upper middle class, if not up, um, in a completely different category to be able to receive the kind, uh, you know, a, a loan, uh, equity loan to actually build an ADU or to have the cash on hand to be able to do that. Uh, typically, that's that's a more stable household. Um, but, but garage conversions really are middle class. Um, and I don't know if we are including that strategy um, when we talk about ADUs. Yes, uh, council member, we are including that as garage conversions are considered uh, and are regulated under the ADU program. And, and um, actually the mayor's office has brought us a couple of, a, a person who's actively working in that space that we've had discussions with. Okay, great. Um, so that there's somebody um, assigned to that? To that so, work, Jackie? So right now I've been working on it and we are in the process of hiring a staff person um, oh, okay. that will be helping with this particular strategy. Okay, great. I, I look forward um, to learning about when when that is. Um, there, I think there's a lot of households who, who want to be compliant and not lose this source of, of funds. Um, through, through the rental of their garage. Um, I'm gonna move on with, um, I'm gonna move on with my question around um, interim housing. And I wanted to make sure that the, that our plans um, that we are, uh, that we have before us with interim housing operations that, that we, continue to preserve Measure E's ability uh, to fund construction of deed restricted affordable housing. Would you say that we are um, in a safe zone uh, and that we're not compromising deed restricted affordable housing construction? So when the council changed the percentage set asides, that was I'm really sorry, Jackie, could you could you speak a little louder? I'm having a hard time hearing you. Sure. Can you hear me now better? Yeah. Okay, great. So when the city council changed the percentage set asides uh, and created the additional category um, for that was, is going to allow us to fund additional homeless support and the construction of interim housing, you know, we did submit a detailed report that showed uh, how this would impact Measure E. And we do feel at this time with the change in the percentages, we're certainly able to continue our affordable housing uh, development, which was a priority for the, the housing department and continue or to invest in interim housing uh, and other homeless solutions. So. Yes, I think we are, we're, we figured that out and we believe the percentage center set asides are sufficient. 
Okay. So I, I just don't want us to find ourselves in a in a in a bind with um, operational costs that we hadn't um, anticipated because we built out uh, too too much of our interim housing options. Um, lastly, there were, uh, the memo that was passed um, in November of last year also asked our city manager to um, convene a joint meeting um, between county and city council. Um, I'd like to know what that that update, if any, is. Council Member Arenas, I believe that falls into the bucket of the three or four requests that we sent over to the county and their response was they'd like to wait until after summer of 2022 um, oh, to have a joint meeting. Well, that is very disappointing as we are both uh, being strategic, we're trying to be strategic with our funding so that we don't um, overlap it. I know that the work that our housing department does with their five-year plan is the level of coordination that I trust. Uh, so I'm not too worried about that, but I folded into this was um, mental health, um, especially uh, at our interim housing site. Um, and so I, I, I guess I don't know what else to say because uh, families are in need and they don't wait, but, but I'll move on. I would love to see when that um, happens, maybe in August. Um, that we can, um, I don't know if it's going to be a meeting of the whole or if it's going to go through committee. Um, I think committee is a, it tends to be very um, efficient. Um, but, you know, I'm completely open to yeah. to the kind of, uh, of sure. A we, framework. And, and we're happy to report back. I, I should note to um, the uh, assistant county executive and I were, were supposed to meet last week and obviously with my illness that didn't happen, but this was one of the subjects. So mm -hmm. I am hopeful that we'll get something on the book and see, you know, whether it's through committee or for through full council and board. Um, th there is a grant that the state provided for many of the districts to turn um, schools into um, community schools and all that means is is for them to offer the wraparound services frank and mckinley is very close to what a community school um should look like where it offers um uh different layers of support and needs for um uh, for our children and our families <clears throat> But I would be interested in seeing if there's any way that we can tap into some of that funding that Santa Clara County Office of Ed is going to receive um, and that we can connect it to our interim housing operations, um, especially those that are impacted um, with families. And I could follow up with you offline, um, uh, Jackie, but I think we need to maximize all of the resources that are out there. Um, and this is this is another source. Uh, so th those are my questions. I, uh, lastly, I just want to thank all of the staff for for the work that they've done and for this um, very thorough um, report. Oh, and then I'll I'll make a motion uh, to move this report. Second. Thank you. There's a motion. Um, I just, Nora just provided me some information shows that apparently the, the resolution, is it is a law, is it an ordinance or is it council resolution that requires? I'm sorry, Mayor. It's um, a council policy. Okay. Um, and, a, and a resolution um, that uh, does does not require the council to approve the spending plan. Only changes to the allocation are required to go through the public hearing process and approval by the council. Um, but the resolution does require HCBC as the oversight committee to review and provide comments to the city council on the annual spending plan. And to the extent there are changes, they would go back to HCBC. And I think staff is um, has brought it forward right. for the council's review and 
blessing, if you will. So just to understand the implication of that, um, with the motion that's on the floor, Nora, um, are we only approving the allocations? And therefore, does Jackie and her team have the flexibility to be able to come back to council and say, hey, you know, we found, we found this opportunity. We're moving half a million dollars over here to address this urgent need uh, without actually getting going through two hearings of the council <laughs> yeah. to be able to do that. Or should, should we actually have a, a special motion that so states? Let me pull up the actual okay. um, resolution. I don't have that, so right. I need to pull that up. We'll go back up. to the council for yeah. more comments, and then we'll, we'll come back. Uh, Councilor Pross? Well, that's where I was at, actually. So I, I actually was going to build off of what you were saying, and I had, I had uh, asked Nora to, to take a, a peek at that to see um, what was required. Because I didn't recall that either, that it got down to the specificity of the spending plan in each individual item. My understanding as well was that it was just the brackets. And um, and if that's the case, then I mean, because I'm, I'm comfortable with this spending plan, uh, I think that where you were getting to, Mayor, was that if there is a slight change in the spending plan, so long as it still falls under the approved percentages, that housing doesn't have to come back to us. They don't, you know, if they, right. as, as maybe stated, they come back to, to report to HCDC and just say, hey, here's where we've moved the money around, but they don't actually need to come to council. I'm fine with asking that that be specific in the motion um, that, you know, we're, what we're approving today are, is something that is within the, the percentages um, and there is a proposed, I guess I'd call it, spending plan, and that, sh you know, that we make it very clear that there's no requirement and should that proposed spending plan change, that that doesn't have to come back to the council. Okay, With, within the within the percentages. Should it change within the percentages, yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, the maker of the motion. I will definitely add that. Um, so uh, for this to be specific to, um, let's see. Yeah, the percentage allocation of the proposed plan and doesn't have to return to council for any adjustment. Within those percentages? Within the percentages. Okay. Great. All right, thank you. And with the seconder? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilor Sparks? Oh, Mayor, I was, uh, I pulled up the, uh, the language from uh, June 2020 um, that referred to the percentages. So we have consistently referred to the percentages. So I just, I also don't think that there's an issue as long as we stay within our allocations. And I just wanted to comment about the future years, which is if uh, this comes to us every year. So if we're gonna see this next year, and if we had concerns about adjusting uh, the buckets, for example, if, um, you know, there was just something else, knock on wood, that another crisis, <laughs> knock on wood, get some salt, throw it over my shoulder. And we wanted to put 80% of it into homeless prevention or whatever. We could, that's up to us to right. make that decision as we just tweaked it. So anyway, I just wanted to say that I, it just pulling from the prior language, I think we're good. So. Yeah. yeah, I agree with everything you say, Councilman Esparza, but I, I think if we were to suddenly do what you suggested, the 80% to prevention, I think that would require two two hearings. Right, I'm, yeah. I'm exaggerating, yeah. but yes. Okay. I was, that was an exaggeration. Okay. I'm just saying it's up to us every year. Right. I didn't mean to freak you out. I'm just saying that it's up to us <laughs> to good. set those percentages in the future. If we were concerned in 23-24, um, this will come back to us in 23. I think we all agree then, okay. Uh, any other comments? All right, let's vote on the motion. Motion passes. All right, thank you. It's now time for open forum. Blair Beekman. Hi, right, thank you, uh, Blair Beekman here. Uh, we're going through our budget time, so uh, thanks, thanks. It's uh, another year. Good luck how we can talk about uh, the next year. Uh, 
you know, I've gone through the ringer <laughs> in, in my explanations, what I think can be possible in this next year, what, what is not possible, possibly happening in the next year. Uh, you know, I, I did not, I mean, I, 2023 has always been a very important year, pivotal year for the future of community energy. And in 2020, they were having statistical reporting, both here in San Jose and in East Bay Community Energy, that uh, suggested that there's a, a concern of something, an oddity in, in 2023 that uh, I tried to make uh, understandable here and to question. And for you guys to be able to uh, hear that and, and to be able to reply to that, it can give you a a way to reply to things, I think, and get a sense of things. And I hope it helped. I don't know if I was correct in that thinking, but lo and behold, look what's happened. Uh, Putin's come on with this war effort and a whole new questions of our future of fracked gas use are, is now up in the air. So this very may well have been the plans for 2023. There's a lot of new questions renewable energy is going to have to be still considering now. and. Um, so it's, I don't know <laughs> what's going to be happening next year. And uh, for you guys to make it clear, good luck how you can do that for us. I think all the public is interested in that sort of thinking. Uh, your help and guidance is needed and openness is just uh, can help a whole community process really well. And with that, good luck on how we all can address how peace can end war in the Ukraine area. We have ways to address it, to address peace. Let's do it. Thank you. Back to the council. All right. Uh, are there? I, I know that I know. Obviously, we have many members of our city team that are here. I assume some would like to speak. Is that true? No. Okay. We certainly see you. But if you'd like to speak, please submit a card. Otherwise, we'll conclude the meeting and adjourn. Okay. We'll adjourn at this time. Thank you very much. <laughs>